Hey gang, for those of you who enjoy QF, a podcast about Howard Stern, and would like to donate to us just via PayPal, you can using the email address johnnythegreek21 at gmail.com. You can check the link in the description for the spelling, and it's also here on the graphic. And if you'd like to do more in terms of uh, donations or subscriptions, you can use our Patreon account and subscribe via the black kluge level and you can receive our weekly content that we're putting only on patreon it's exclusive for that platform and um anything over five dollars is just gravy guys we love you thank you so much no no i'm just like a happy-go-lucky guy and all this is about having fun that's right I'm not looking for any special treatment. When I walk in, I don't want you averting your eyes. I don't want you bowing not me. Nothing like that, no. Nothing like that. Jesus, the longest book promotion. Yeah, but I'm not you. Cle- no, in other words, you're I- not. Clear the halls. That's what I want. But my- no, and what, and what's so great about it is, is that if I met you in person, you wouldn't have the balls to come up and say that to me. Because I'd sock you in the fucking head. And probably deck you. What? I, I have to uh, get rid of the wrap-up show. because, <laughs> And I'll tell you why. The purpose of the rapper show is not to sit there and criticize me. Whatever I'm doing is so that everyone here can make a living. I got a guy now who's finding out the real names of the occupations of what the people do who bully me. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of a fighter, so... Because I I, I drive into Manhattan every day and I listen to you, okay? And if you cut out the bitching, it probably would be about an hour of (laughs) broadcast. You're right. Do you want to know something? Okay. I said earlier I thought it was kind of weird that Jerry still dyes his hair. Like, you know, when your head becomes that big and, you know, whatever. You've got a little tuft of hair. You'd think the vanity would go out the window, but no. It's my mind, not my penis. <laughs> that I have to train. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm working on training my penis. That's where I've been going wrong. That's why I lost half my money. <laughs> I can't believe my penis. Uh, train the mind. Where'd you what? You come up with Tzvi? Tzvi? Yeah, they named me Tzvi. First of all, fuck you. My name is Howard. Why can't you just be Howard? Why do you have to have a separate name? They had name? to give you a Hebrew name. I see how it operates. Now instead, I'm not just the fan or the comic who sits in every once in a while. I see how the place really operates. I see, yeah, it really is all Howard's story. <laughs> you know what? That's my problem. That's why I'm at the psychiatrist. I always do that in social <laughs> situations. I go, let me see how I can make this about me. I'll tell a witty story. Meanwhile, I'm witty, too. Well, I know it's less than last year. That's why that is not true. Yeah, well, yeah, I make less money than last year because I work three days a week, but I, I got a raise. And how do you figure? How do I figure? I looked at my paycheck, you fucker. I mean, bro, if you work four hours a day, now it's down to three days a week, sometimes four days a week. We're working four days this week. All right. You read the paper, and you get half the stories wrong. So yeah. Now, how long are you going to keep the hair thing? I'm going to keep the hair as long as it keeps uh, on there's top a, of my head. What there's do you mean? a point in time that it's... Uh, is my hair too long, you think? When you get a certain age, I think that the Do you hair... think it looks silly? Yeah. You do? Really? I do. I don't want to be pranked ever. I prank no one else. Okay. Okay. I'm the prankster here, boy. This is my world. I'm just letting you get a taste of it. And when I pull you out of this world, it's torture. Welcome, everybody, to QF, the podcast about Howard Stern. I'm your host, Phil Moore, a.k.a. Jim Fix, and today we are tackling our long-awaited project, the Colford, the Paul D. Colford unauthorized biography of Howard Stern. It's called King of All Media. I think I've titled it something else in the Photoshop, but uh, we've been promising this one for a long time, and we're finally delivering, guys. So with me, of course, is Sam. Welcome, Sam. Hey, guys. And Benjamin is on board for this one. Once he knew we were doing this and he was able to free up the time, he was here. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Of course. Hi, everyone. I'm always <laughs> happy to discuss what I call the Hater's Handbook, yeah. the Paul Colfer book. That's right. And the first time we managed to do this was when we were still at Radio Gunk. We did, Ben and I and Monique actually did the Quivers of Life uh, book. And we did such a great job on it because we we gave it full, we gave it full, uh, attention. I mean, I think it took eight hours worth of uh, coverage, and we had the audio tapes, and that's why I wanted to try the same with the Colford book, if it existed, and sure enough, it did. And guess what, guys? <laughs> Robert, sorry, uh, Elliot Gould does the narration for the audio tapes, which couldn't be more perfect. Yeah, Sam. You had me in stitches during the Quivers of Life, and I think the 15 Foundation is almost a continuation 
of her awfulness. It's like part two, Quivers of Life, the 15 Foundation saga, is building on to just her absolute insanity. Just, (laughs) it's unreal. Her life is insane. And just just before you think we're done with this, when this is finished, guys, which will take a, quite a while, it's it's a, a bit of a slog. Uh, we're going to stab at the vegetation of Robin as well, and that's going to be a lot of fun oh. because there's so much more audio visual stuff, especially visual, uh, with her Twitter uh, Twitter presence at the time and the videos that they put on YouTube. It's really amazing. Um, before we begin, I just want to make sure people understand the criticisms leveled against the book. Uh, are partly things that were out of Colford's control because in the introduction, which isn't part of the audiobook, I'll read it. Um, this is what he has to say. So, uh, sorry, the acknowledgments, not the introduction. My my bad. So it says here, Howard Stern declined to be interviewed for this book. To the best of my knowledge, however, he issued no all points bulletin urging people from his present and past to ignore my inquiries uh, or inquiries. Uh, as a result, only a few people turned down my requests for interviews. Those few included his father, Ben Stern, who called me one day to politely explain that he did interviews only if Howard had asked him to, in, in parentheses. And clearly, Howard did not want him to speak to me, <laughs> speak with me. So he, so he managed to get a hold of almost everybody he wanted to, except for Ben and Mel Carmazin. And uh, it says here... Oh, Mel he, Car- he definitely didn't... Sorry to cut you off, but he yeah, definitely didn't go- get in touch with... Buckwald with Robin, no Fred, way. you know, yeah, or Gary, even for that matter. Uh, right. I mean, he may have in the past, and so he's using. He admits he's using a lot of his own articles that he wrote for, um, uh, I think, Newsday uh, yeah. in the past. And so Mel Carm is in the president of Infinity Broadcasting Corporation, who probably has a terrific book of his own to write about managing growing companies and handling star talent. Was constantly accessible during the eight years that I wrote Newsday's radio column. This time, he said. Howard asked me not to cooperate. Howard works for me, and I respect his wishes. Um, so, and it says at the bottom, although a few potential sources quaked at the notion of speaking about their encounters with Howard, hundreds of others shared information and stories with an eye towards helping me chronicle his life thoroughly and accurately. And he doesn't mention them, of course, because he knows they're probably going to get in shit if they do, uh, you know, mention it. And as far as I know, in the archives, he doesn't actually bring up this book. I was looking for audio just in case and through 90, 1996, which was when the book was published, and I didn't catch anything. He also said in the acknowledgments, I also had eight years of my own reporting to draw on. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's a lot. Paul, Paul Colford definitely had credentials as a journalist. I mean, right. this book is expertly researched. Um, he gives in He gives thanks to all the people who aided him in research. He also, before this book on Howard, wrote a book similarly on Rush Limbaugh. So yes. he re- he really knew radio. Um, and he, I would say that there was definitely no agenda with his book, meaning it was, he's not trying to bust Howard as a fraud or anything like that. No, he's trying to present a, 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 an, accurate, an accurate depiction of who he really is and where he got his influences from. And this is why some people have asked, should would we recommend it? Well, we wouldn't do a show about it if we didn't recommend it, I suppose. But... It is, it is, it is, it is a bit dry, I would say, but I would read it just to counterbalance the bullshit narrative that Howard would have you believe exists, not only in private parts in Miss America, but the later, you know, the uh, Howard Stern comes again as well. Sam? Before we started, we said, well, if you had Howard participate in the book, would would we have liked if he would have participated in this? And it wouldn't be the same because Howard doesn't give an honest depiction of himself when he presents his own story and his own narrative. Mm-hmm. So in a way, it's almost better that he didn't participate in this. You get a more honest picture about his life when he's not involved. Yeah, if Howard told you, for example, I've never heard of Steve Dahl, he wouldn't have bothered to go and investigate to see if Howard, in fact, did listen to Steve Dahl tapes. He probably would have just taken Howard's word for it. So it's good that he didn't, that he just, that Howard didn't participate because he didn't have, um, he wasn't bound to what Howard said and say, well, I don't want to upset my primary source here. Yeah. So I guess I'll leave that part out. Right. And as, as, a, as a source of, uh, as a uh, source of information, guys, this book is the real deal. We will tell you that. The only downside is, of course, it ends at 96, 95, really. However, there's um, some post, uh, sorry, uh, there's another postscript 
postscript that's in the paperback version that's not in the hardcover. So if you want to read the whole complete thing, I sent the pages to Ben, and a lot of it is numbers, like adding what what new markets he's added uh, subsequently to the print of the hardcover, and then also talks a little bit about private parts. And there's some funny stuff that we'll go into when we get closer to the end. And as far as recommending this book, I want to show you guys. This is my copy right here. And there are, because I reference it many times, there's one time I was doing it with a pink marker, another time I was doing it with a yellow marker, and another time where I had no markers and I was underlining it with a pen. And the point that I want to illustrate there is every time I revisit this thing, I find something new that is intriguing. And Yeah, I have notes in mind. Sam's showing. She's got notes written down. Uh, every time I revisit it, because it can be dry and because it could be just a single sentence, you yeah. hit it again and go, whoa, wait a minute. That's revealing. Right. So, but you have to be committed to um, your hate in order to revisit it as often as I have. Well, that, yeah, and also using it to counterbalance the bullshit, like I said, as and the, the funny part is, um, like with the Robin book, I think I read the, uh, the, sorry, the quotes related to the book and they were all uniformly negative and, uh, how Robin decided, well, they're still talking about me. It's better than not being talked about at all. Or the book company decided this is all we had. So they put it on the book jacket and this one's no different. Judge Lance Ito responding to Howard's on-air remarks during jury selection in the O.J. Simpson trial. I'm going to send Howard an autographed picture and I'm going to write on it. Howard, enjoy the show. Just don't get arrested in L.A. Um... Garrison Keeler, host of public radio, well, pre former host of public radio's A Prairie Home Companion. Howard Stern is a geek. He's the guy in the carnival who ate the live chicken. <laughs> he stands there with blood dripping down his chin and feathers in his mouth. How could anybody do that? Uh, Sam? Also, the Colford book is great because when you pad this with interviews that he did in the past, so I have like a plethora of magazines around this same time period, you can go back to what Howard said versus the truth in the Colford book, and you can reference back to the truth and what Howard said. And you just ping pong back and forth to, oh, no, wait, actually, that's not what was happening. That's not the reality of what was going on. But Howard frames it in this complete lie in mm -hmm. say Rolling Stone or Time Magazine, yep. but that's not actually what was happening. <laughs> no, and so uh, it's invaluable in that sense, guys, and especially if you, I'd say just for the coverage of the uh, Fox pilots uh, test shows, it's worth the read, absolutely, because he spares no expense uh, explaining exactly how awful they are, or you could just watch them on YouTube and have a brain. Um, let's get started, if we can. Uh, ben, anything to add before we get started? Just that my real only con re my only real criticism of the book is that because there are certain things that only you could only know if you were allowed to talk to Allison, if mm -hmm. you were allowed to talk to, um, yeah, uh, let's let's stick with Allison. Since he can't, really, all he can do is take Howard's word for it that. On the air, he's this way, but at home, he's a doting father and family mm -hmm. man who loves nothing more than to be with his children and, and, and family. And we know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So that's my one criticism of this book, really, is that for certain parts, he has to take Howard's word for it. Mm -hmm. And then he also has to uh, reference other articles written by other people who also have the same issue. So, yeah. I mean, it's 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 going to be, uh, uh, there's, there's going to be a bit of... Uh, whitewashing inherent anyway. Journalists had that same problem too. In the Time Magazine article uh, by Kurt Anderson, he said kind of the same tone that you were taking. Well, if you took Howard's word from it, he has this picturesque marriage as opposed to Limbaugh's marriage or divorce, mm -hmm. but you would have to take his word for it, basically what he, he was saying. Yeah. So yeah. it was more you know, tongue in cheek, like, okay, but that's just what he's saying. We really don't know this, but right. okay. Sure. Right. So, 
yeah, and if the, if the narrator is unreliable, uh, why do you hinge your book on someone who's re- uh, re- unreliable? And uh, I mean, I'm sure Judith Regan had a feel that like she must have had her hands full trying to coordinate his bullshit and making it every story the same every time, uh, according to him. So the first one is from chapter one one. It's called Gerardo looks for a casa. And uh, this is a real this is a bit of a long clip, but thankfully we don't have to worry about the uh, 30 second rule. Audioscope presents Howard Stern, King of All Media, the unauthorized biography by Paul D. Colford, read by Elliot Gould. <laughs> Aren't you missing the Rob Zombie music? <laughs> This is my first time hearing this. I always wanted to be on the radio. I think I can relate to a mic better than I can to people. I feel more comfortable around it, which is maybe sad, but the mic doesn't talk back. <laughs> that was one of the quotes in the uh, in the opening, uh, right before the acknowledgments. And uh, I, I hate to cut it off like that, but uh, it's so true. If it, it, we just went through the Netflix thing, we were cutting some clips that we're going to use for this chapter, and. It's almost as if Letterman isn't there, so there's the the aesthetic is the same is exactly as what that said. Yeah, in a way, he's not saying I like inanimate objects because they don't talk back. It's because they don't refute you when you're lying. Yeah, um, <laughs> speaking to a person, a person. I mean, we hear time and time again when Howard recalls an event that someone else was uh, was a party to. They always say that's not how it happened. So he would much <laughs> rather you not be involved in the story. Com- completely. Day after day, a man identifying himself as Mr. Howard called. He sounded unduly mysterious, skipping all pleasantries and asking to speak immediately with one of the saleswomen. Word around the real estate agency, which sold expensive homes on the north shore of Long Island, New York, was that Mr. Howard wanted to move elsewhere because unwelcome people had discovered where he lived. One prospect, described as a partially built home in the woods, Far removed from neighbors, far removed from the main road. <laughs> Sounds like the the hideout of a serial killer. But let's let's continue. <laughs> made him curious, because he would see the place. He insisted that his interest and visit be absolutely confidential. He agreed to meet the saleswoman at a time when her colleagues planned to be away from the office and no other clients would be around. When the so, appointed hour what an e- <laughs> what an every man. Yeah. <laughs> can can the, every person drive? Can every trucker relate? And he prioritized it must yes. have a basement Howard with doors Stern. that lock from the desk. Yeah, exactly. And his wife, Allison. For all of the hush hush preliminaries, the secretive, lanky, six foot five Mr. Howard wore a conspicuous red bandana <laughs> around his head and a limousine hardly deflected stairs. Bang colors. <laughs> He had traveled only a short distance from his home. Radio's most famous shock jock also had come a long way. I said, now he wore the red bandana around his head. Could that be covering up initial starting to lose his hair? Oh, yeah. He'd been losing it. As far as we know, the audio comes from 81, the famous, uh, you know, am I balding, Robin? And uh, I think he was balding, much like myself, way earlier than people think. And then that David Brenner appearance on Good Day New York or whatever it was where he, well, Henny Youngman calls him out and said, what's with that poodle on your hair, a squirrel or whatever it is? And, uh, and then he starts moving it. And he goes, it's a weave. There's no joke. Yeah. He literally no. says, it's a weave. And the thing moves like a pith helmet that's just been knocked over. So <laughs> you, that was just the rock and roll look as far as I know, because he started getting into that uh, whatever D. Snyder looked like. That's what the, 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 uh, the look he copied. This clip, next clip, guys, is called uh, The Birth of a Monster. When Howard Stern was growing up on Long Island, he had started out about 12 miles and several income levels south of the North Shore in Roosevelt. After the Second World War, the availability of open land in Roosevelt and its proximity to Manhattan, 20 miles away, made the community a natural choice for housing development. Howard Stern's father was among those who went looking to buy. Living at the time on East 156th Street in the Bronx, Ben Stern became serious about a spirited young woman, Ray Schiffman. Ben and Ray were married on May 17, 1947. 
Their first child, Ellen, was born in the Bronx two years later. The family moved to the Jackson Heights section of Queens, where they resided when their son, Howard Allen, was born on January 12, 1954. And as I explained to you guys earlier in uh, the uh, thread that we have, some of the information is truncated. A lot of it is the whole. The audio tapes are it's an un, it's a it's a cut up version of the book. It's not complete, guys. Just like with the Robin book, and they don't talk a lot about Ben or um, Ray's history, which I would love to talk about briefly here for a second. Sure, please, please do. You know, um, I think it's easy to get the impression that Ben and Ray were born in Europe. The, the way that Howard talks about uh, escaping the Nazis and so on, they were both both born in New York, um, mm-hmm. and the only person whose family interacted with Nazis, who lost family members to Nazis, is Ray's stepmother. So they're not even blood related. Mm-hmm. So, right. um, but so there, there's something that um, when I re, I don't know, revisited this my third or fourth time, that that uh, got my attention and I had to go and look into it. And this was about Ben's military service. Now we know that Howard loves military men and wants to hear any military story, but he <laughs> never asks his father about his military service. No, he, he doesn't. Uh, it, it's strange. He never talks about it. And so Ben Stern was in the military during World War II, but he never left America. He was in New York. Right. There was, and, no act, there was no active service. I mean, he, 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 didn't, yeah, he, didn't he, see, he, he didn't see action. Right. But he served at a base that was once a Japanese internment camp for Japanese Americans and for Japanese citizens. Now, this piqued my interest because we know how Howard feels about the Japanese, especially when he was a young boy. Mm-hmm. So um, I looked into it, and about six months before Ben Stern was stationed there, uh, I found a letter online that says that the, the Japanese Americans who had been interned had been sent to Maryland. But Ben was later transferred to California, and I, they don't get into where in California he went, so I wasn't able to look up um, its record. But California did intern Japanese Americans and citizens for another couple years after Ben Stern was transferred there. So given... First of all, Howard's complete lack of interest when George Takei brings up uh, being interned. He yeah. has no sympathy and no interest. But beyond that, the recording of Howard when he's, I don't know, 6, 10, around that age. And we're going to play and, it. Okay. Do you want to play that now? or um, That's I'm, what it, it, that makes complete sense to me now. Why he didn't want to go to that play. Why mm-hmm. he would. Oh, my God. God, that's why he didn't so, want to sit through so, that play, why he always skates over George's. It's that always bothered me. I'm like, you know, Howard loves a good, you know, Nazi story, a good drama like that. And he always hated when George brought up internment camps. And I yeah. never understood why he brushed by that. I was like, why does he why does this bother him so much? Well, okay. yeah, so that that leads to this famous recording okay so i've got it set up here let's see if it works uh, thank you very much uh, one other question do you feel that the united states should no. remain in the united nations as a member of the united nation howard yes i really do uh, is there any sp- special reason why you feel that they <laughs> yeah. should? well there should be peace in all the countries and we wouldn't have any war because we don't want the japs anymore <laughs> i told you not to be stupid you moron oh. uh, <laughs> Now, now, okay. <laughs> now, just to okay, he doesn't say we don't want the Nazis anymore. He says we don't want the Japs anymore. Yeah. Now, Ben Stern never interacted with a Nazi. He no. did likely interact with Japanese. Howard yes. had never interacted with Japanese before. I mean, Roosevelt was Jewish and Catholic and black. So for him to single out, we don't want the Japanese and the, the Japs, as he calls them, anymore, mm-hmm. and make the machine gun sound. He wants to exterminate the Japanese. He wants peace and to exterminate the Japanese. Right. Um, so my my and, and so also the the fact that Ben's reaction, I told you not to be stupid, you moron. <laughs> everyone takes that out of context. Everyone right. ignores the fact that his son just said he wanted to exterminate the Japanese. Right. So. That's 
forgivable that you would call your son a moron for saying something like that. I think but so. Now, now imagine this. And, and, you know, Howard later on in that clip, I don't, you probably don't have it there. He goes, what? I was just doing some nip humor for my old man. That's what he, <laughs> that's what he says. Now, yeah. imagine if instead of we don't want the Japs anymore, Howard had said we don't want the blacks anymore. Would he have played that clip on the air and laughed about how funny it was that he was saying, let's machine gun down the blacks? Well, he I don't stupid, think so. He was stupid enough that he might have. Uh, I, and and, and I, at a time when so. maybe not, uh, but it was certainly more uh, less. You were certainly less likely to get any kind of blowback in 1990, whatever, 1991, 92, if it was early 90s, than if it was Asian related. They were, it was I, it's almost given, you know, like. Listen, That's acceptable. Go ahead, uh, Sam. He he's went on talk shows in blackface. So I, <laughs> who's to say he's pretty uh, dumb? Yeah, and he's, but yeah. he also said some pretty heinous things in print about black people. So I'm I'm not so sure that he yeah, he never threatened he to kill them all. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very true. Yeah. I, no, he, mer- he, he merely spent an hour and a half of a show uh, last year uh, after the George Floyd thing saying, if blacks move into your neighborhood, you as a white person are going to move out. That's just oh, a fact. Yeah. <laughs> that was I, his I, way that, of doing well, it. I have something to say about that, too, when we get to that. Um, <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. I yeah. can't believe he said that. Um, also, interesting, a child doesn't get that from nowhere. So no. the conversation had to have been going on in the household from the adults. That's what I assume. I assume that there is ben no Stern, way that yeah. Ben came home and didn't say something about his job. Now this all makes sense. Wow. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's an, so that it's just funny because as an adult, my mind. <laughs> as an adult, Howard says, all I heard about was how bad the Nazis were, how bad. So then why didn't he say, uh, we don't want the Nazis anymore. Yeah. <laughs> he said, we don't want the Japs anymore. Right. Well, the other thing is, and I have to add this, the way Ben says it, it suggests that, well, it's obvious, but it suggests that he he knows Howard is an idiot and he knows that he's a, a pain in the ass and he knows he's going to say something stupid. So when he does, <laughs> and I told you not yeah. to be stupid, it means that he's had to feel this from his fucking stupid son again, time and time again. And later on, Ellen, we have cl- clips she's going to say he was an awful kid. Like he really was a handful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, the next clip, I believe, is called, uh, okay, <laughs> so I think I got this one, Ex- uh, Exc- Eccentric Howard, and I, I oh, no, no, we're going to play, we still have a little more of this clip, sorry, my mistake, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you moron. How could you be anything else? Oh, You're man. I told you not to be stupid, you moron. Oh, man. <laughs> I told you. I told you I'd screw up. You see, you never do that to my sister. <laughs> you were starting to feel comfortable, I guess. So you <laughs> yeah. thought you'd throw in a little levity. We don't want the jabs anymore. Yeah. I was doing some shtick. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Are oh, you cut up? Oh, no, no. Keep going with the clip. Uh, and when you're done with the clip. Oh, no, that's the end of the clip. I, I, I think I uh, have it. Uh, I know I have the original clip, but at any rate, you're right. It did say that. And I just wanted to cut it short to keep it because <laughs> we mm-hmm. have so many clips yeah. to go through. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. He does say that, uh, Ben. Sam? So in regards to that clip, um, in the Rolling Stone, February 10th, 1994 article, um, he's asked, uh, what about your youth? Besides being called a moron by your father, raised like a veal by your mom, and growing up the only white kid in an all-black neighborhood, did you have a happy childhood? No, I wouldn't really call it happy. I was talking to my daughter the other day, my 10-year-old. I never really sat there and told her that I lived in an all-black neighborhood, and that's why I was so fucking depressed. Because I think that would send the wrong message to her, as if black people were bad. I said to my daughter, imagine what it would be like... If all your friends moved away and she said, oh, I would hate that. I said, well, what? That's what happened to me. All my friends moved away and they wouldn't come back and visit me because their parents were afraid. I had one or two black friends and that was it. My parents would uh, my parents could pick and choose. They would they would go and meet some uh, some of the more middle class upscale black people. They'd get in their car and drive and go see their white friends. They had a nice life. If I, on the other hand, was in prison every day when people ask, and then the journalist says, when people ask, how can you say things you say about black people, calling them monkeys, for instance, your defense is I grew up with black people. I uh, have no defense for anything I say. I just 
bullshit my way through life. <laughs> mm. Isn't That's, that nice? Yeah. It's wonderful. And never See, gets nowadays, to ask about it. Nowadays, he would say, I've never called them monkeys. Right. Well, I've in 1994, he was just bullshitting his way through life, everyone. Yeah. Uh, so we're, the next clip is uh, called, if I'm not mistaken, Eccentric Howard. And that was the, uh, the one I intended from the history of Howard Stern. Well, my recollection was he was a very happy child. Maybe when he got a little older, there was some other factors. But starting at the beginning, it uh, worked out very well. He seemed happy and adjusted there. He made a lot of friends. And he was very into uh, entertainment. He would, ent- he would get these kid friends of his together, did a lot of entertaining, and, you know, it's a good childhood. I didn't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> okay, so already Ben's <laughs> Ben's putting a little hole into his narrative, as, as Sam just read, and who do you believe? And, again, we talked about this raven before. In pre- with previous podcasts, we've explained, when Howard does this fumpering and stuttering, and you're going to hear that examples of that as well in video form here tonight, guys. When other people start talking and they, they recollect things, and Ben was still, he had his faculties when they recorded this, he doesn't stutter, he doesn't stammer, he, it's just matter-of-factly. And if he's a bullshit artist, he's a gifted one because it sounds to me like he's being as truthful as he possibly can be. You, your, your take, guys? I don't doubt any of that. Right. Like, do you hear anything of that that sounds like Howard coaching his father to say <laughs> the opposite of exactly he's trying to say? Every day well, to his audience? No, I mean, because because everyone interviewed says just what Ben said. Exactly. That, so, that yeah. the only person not saying that is Howard. Mm-hmm. Sam? Well, I mean, even look at the journalist saying he's bullshitting his way through life. So, okay, <laughs> sure. Thanks for the okay. information. You know, so, so the, the, fun, uh, the phenomenon that happened is in, this is, this is my theory, that... Jackie was gifted at turning Howard's contempt for black people into jokes. Mm-hmm. So this, you know, and, and you know, the the book will acknowledge that um, Howard started taking took liberties with the truth and so on. But at a certain point, Howard decided, just like he's decided, private parts of the movie was his real life. Mm-hmm. He's decided that really did happen to me. I really was <laughs> abused all the time. I really yeah. was abandoned Eaten by up. my father. I, yeah. I, all that stuff really was true. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I joked 10 years ago, I don't know, five years ago, that at a certain point, Howard is going to say, I really was a Vietnam super soldier. <laughs> I really did go and mow down villages. Um, <laughs> because he said it enough times and yep. to the point where people accepted his truth. Yep. And so you're going to hear from Ray, I believe, uh, uh, just give a punctuate um, uh, Ben's thoughts. As far as I'm concerned, I feel the same way. It was a small town, a mile by a mile, and everybody knew one another. And Howard had friends, and he was very, very busy, very involved with his friends, and... uh, was selective of friends. I mean, he didn't have too many, but... Uh... That's code for they had to be Jewish. <laughs> and gay. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, you go through his list of friends, and they're only Jewish. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, in a neighborhood where you kind of... You, I don't know, it depends. Like, when I was growing up, we were thrown into the... It was a very, like, a working-class uh, school. So we had Polish kids, Chinese kids, a few, believe it or not. A lot of Portuguese kids, Italian kids, definitely ethnic, like kids of ethnic uh, immigrants all uh, joining together. And you really don't see race until one day someone says something horrific, and then all of a sudden you learn this word that you never knew before. So um, you, you hang out with... You, what is this expression? Water finds its own level. You hang out where you're told to hang out and where you, you know. So with me, it was Greek kids, mostly Portuguese kids, and, and, and that was the neighborhood. His neighborhood was specifically Jewish, and then later on... Well, it was to, largely Jewish. The well-met but, stuff, and, yeah. But I mean, by the ahead. time he's two, according to Col- Colford, by 1957, yeah. when Howard you know, was a little over two, I guess three, mm-hmm. uh, an estimated 20% of Roosevelt's re- residents were black. So from the time... Howard could even have had any memories whatsoever. Mm-hmm. One out of five families in Roosevelt was already black. Yeah. So um, with his claims of it being all white, his memory of his neighborhood being all white, there, even that is inaccurate. Yes. One out of five was black. Right. 
exuberant kind of kid. And uh, what he did, he enjoyed doing, and he did it wholeheartedly. And uh, to me, he seemed to be doing good. So it very paints a very different picture from, you know, I was, in a, I was a veal in a cage and all this bullshit. Uh, and we're going to go a little further into that. This is called Roosevelt Explained Kinda. In 1955, Ben followed thousands of other veterans in search of greener spaces farther east of the city. The house that he and Ray selected was one of the single family dwellings in Roosevelt. What made Roosevelt unusual on predominantly white Long Island was the community's integrated population. By 1957, an estimated 20% of Roosevelt's residents were black. A decade later, the number of black residents was 60%. So there was always, that's the number that comes up when we talk to, uh, when, his, when he does the Channel 9 show with Mr. Chestnut, 60%, 60-40 was the divide. And I'm sure in a, uh, a community that small, they would have been able to figure that out as census-wise pretty quickly. Yeah, and sixty forty does not mean you're the only white person around. <laughs> as yeah. he, and as the media allows him to claim without challenge. Yeah. yeah. Sixty forty. He acts like seriously, sixty forty. He acts like it was ninety nine to one. Picture, picture yourself, Samantha, going into a room where there are four women and six men, and you look around and you go. My God, I'm the only woman in this room. That's the equivalent of what he's doing. I think that now's the time to put in the Photoshop. I made a, I, I did a mock-up of uh, Ice Cube's first album, America, America KKK's Most Wanted, and Howard <laughs> as Ice Cube. <laughs> I changed the title a little bit, but either way, he, that's he loves that's Ice like, that's how he, he'd love he'd love for it to be that way, but we know different. Yeah, late, if, if this was, I'm sorry to cut cut you off, but if this was a truly multimedia thing. You could splice in footage from the video of Howard's family as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I could direct you to it if you don't have it. There's mm -hmm. a foot. There's footage of Ben trying to teach Ray how to ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's what the footage is, and Howard's filming it. I take it. Yeah. And in the background, you can see a girl wearing a black girl uh, yeah. who's watching them. She lo she looks like she's dressed for church. Yeah. She looks like the advertise she could be on an advertisement for something she looks mm -hmm. like you know picturesque but in it. howard's mind she's professor griff and the s1w's marching down the street she's <laughs> chanting <laughs> tawana brawley was never you know didn't lie she's just she's right. doing all that stuff she's she's ice cube marching down the street in the express yourself video uh so it's it, he it just doesn't match what he paints yeah yeah he says so when he's talking about growing up in uh, this neighborhood in the 1994 Rolling Stone article, he says, I think black people have a tremendous sense of humor. You don't want to stereotype a whole race and say they have a tremendous sense of humor. That sounds kind of weird, too. But there was a self-effacing there's a there was a self-effacing humor in the black community that was incredible. People were killing each other. People were stabbing teachers. But at the same time, you'd see sort of of a very human side a guy would say you motherfucking n-word and the other one would go you mothers a nasty haired big lip bitch and those and these guys would go back and forth all day and it was funny fucking stuff there's humor in every ethnic group i don't think i'm racist i don't do it out of hatred i do it because i think it's funny so okay. howard would would see a black kid <laughs> stab a teacher <laughs> then turn around and call a classmate the N-word, and they'd all just break up in laughter, I guess. Yeah, yep. yeah. So that <laughs> that picturesque girl riding a bike would say, oh. big, hairy-lipped, what? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. She was ranking out Ray and Ben as they were riding around on a bicycle. <laughs> but, um, she, brought, she brought out a shank and started stabbing a teacher? <laughs> yeah. I mean... <laughs> Making her neck go side to side. And, yeah. It's all funny. <laughs> Humor. Okay. I don't want to stereotype. You know, you know what's very annoying though, is that no one, no reporter, not even Sonny Houston from The View, challenges him when he says this stuff. Right. I mean, you know, I you know, I just listened to a, one of your Patreon podcast film more yesterday, so I know that you have a great memory of him going on The View and saying, "I never used the N word." Yes. Now he he's telling an eyewitness 
lawyer, uh, are you going to believe me, the most honest man in radio, or your own lying ears? And she says, effectively, I, I believe you. Yeah. Well, but effectively, I, if you ask her right now, two years later, did Howard say the N-word? Is she going to say yes or is she going to say no? Because she let him get away with it. On, yeah. on she, she didn't say, hold on, I got an MP3s in my uh, car. I'll play it for you. She, well, she let him have it. It was it was it was speculated when we were at the old place that there was she had an earpiece in with directions being given to her by some production assistant or or you know director saying look let him get away with this because we don't have time to get into a political thing he's supposed to be here to plug his stupid book and we really don't have time for this and if Ro if what's her name um, Whoopi who really didn't want this to get back in there and maybe derail what little career she has left because if you recall at the time Ted Danson. I mean, he was a really scary time because he did something that the only reason it came out was uh, Montel Jordan, uh, not Montel Jordan, Montel Williams, my mistake, guys, sorry, uh, was at the Friars, he, Montel, Montel Williams was at the Friars Club when they did this. And the Friars Clubs at that point were private affairs. They were never meant to be publicized. And he went to the press saying, I was offended and this is what happened. And I believe a photo was produced, which was taken, but normally that wouldn't happen. The Friars Club, I mean, they're very, very hard to find, even especially the older, the older ones that I have a few of them. And it was... All the jokes were written by Whoopi for Ted to do. It was it was pre-planned, and she didn't have a problem with it. He decided he had a problem with it, and then it almost fucking destroyed Ted Danson's career. I mean, it was really, really, you know, in 1994. Yeah. And so for Howard, we understand at the time, we, why didn't you just say, yes, I did those things, and, you know, I did those things, and it was acceptable then, but I wouldn't do that now. Why lie in front of those people at The View Knowing yeah. there's this evidence out there, that's some kind of, some kind of, uh, some kind of delusional narcissism but, that I have never been able to fathom. Sam, I'm less pissed about Howard. Howard lying to me isn't the surprising part. That's obvious. I mean, that's yep. like breathing for that fucking huckster. I'm not yes. surprised about that at all. I'm mm -hmm. surprised that that Sonny knew it, heard it, remembered it, right. knows it, and let it. Whoopi let it go over. She smoothed it over. She said, Robin would never let him say that. And that was the end of it. And there's, she, well, that's, there's well, video she, evidence she, of it. <laughs> she's well, in that's charge. Exactly why. She's in charge. Whoopi runs the show. And she just said, Robin would never let him say it. And that was the end of it. Yeah. And that's exactly why you don't want Howard involved with a biography about Howard. Because he's, he's, when he sell, tells you, you didn't hear me say that. Like he's Obi Wan Kenobi. You didn't hear me say that, and then you're supposed to repeat back to him. I didn't hear you say that. That's right. Um, so you you can't publish it basically because your source is saying if you publish it, and I'm on record saying I didn't say it, there's going to be trouble. Gaslighting 101, folks. Felt experience. And the there's Mont. I also appreciate Montel Williams showing off the self-effacing black sense of humor that Howard says they all have by <laughs> rushing to the press and saying I'm offended. And I think that was that was promotion for him, to be honest with you. I think that was strictly yeah, a yeah. media thing to get his show some more ratings and nothing more. White flight. An exodus hastened by exaggerated fears of middle-class blacks who were buying into formerly all-white neighborhoods and by the influx of other blacks who were receiving public assistance and renting available properties. By the fall of 1965, when Howard was in the sixth grade, Long Island experienced its biggest school boycott. 1,235 students, one-third of the enrollment in Roosevelt's five public schools, stayed home during a two-day NAACP protest against what the civil rights group considered de facto segregation in the elementary schools. Washington Rose School, which Howard was attending, was a notable exception. Its enrollment of around 650 was divided almost 50-50 between white and non-white students. Howard's liberal parents talked liberally about the civil rights movement, even during his preteen years, when he was barely able to grasp its significance. Young Howard confronted with shyness the changes swirling in the community. He is remembered by former neighbors in Roosevelt as a gawky kid who mostly kept to himself. <laughs> Howard explained to New York Magazine in 1985, being Jewish is a pain in the ass sometimes. I was totally out of my culture. I wanted to be black in the worst way then. 
<laughs> I guess I guess that Photoshop I mentioned is uh, is a lot more apt than I realized. Uh, ben, you wanted to say? Yeah. Um, this so the some tangent some chan- tangents that I've gone off on to prepare for this era of the Howard Stern thing mm-hmm. has led me to question a lot of the. I know so Paul Colford is a journalist. And he's going to repeat journalist talking points without question. Mm-hmm. And the, this white flight thing, the, the beginning and end part is black people move in, white people flee. But they leave out the middle. And Paul sort of touches on the middle a little bit here. And it's not as simple as just black people move in, white people move out. That's because right. he buries in there in that same, same sentence that along with the middle class homeowners – Mm-hmm. were people on welfare living in public housing. Now, yeah. they share the same race, but they don't share other traits. You know, mm-hmm. some are buying their own home and they're responsible people and as the book says, take better care of the house and the lawn than the predecessors did. Mm-hmm. But also, the government sho- shoved welfare recipients into this neighborhood. And it overwhelms, and um, this might be this might have been in the audio narration, and maybe it isn't, but it's in the book. It overwhelms the school system so much that the public schools either had to ask for more taxes, which the mm-hmm. residents didn't want to pay. Right. So they had to make the choice. There's going to be no sports, and there's going to be no more new library books because we have to devote all of our funds to feeding the kids on welfare. So the kids on welfare did not assimilate. They did not. They they were not um, used to being around white people, like the kids mm-hmm. who Howard had grown up with, the black kids, who were used to being around white people and liked them. But these kids coming from the inner city to, had not grown up around white people and, as Colford points out, were remedial. It yes. required this, the education to focus, to go to the lowest common denominator. Right, now, the educator. Yeah, so – Leaving out all of that stuff, and then of course there's the tales of violence, which might be true and might not be true, mm-hmm. um, according to. I mean, I for one don't believe Howard was beaten up. He oh, claims God. he was. Believe me, um, that's going to be a whole section of this. Yeah, right. So, so there is there's virtually no success record of turning a neighborhood into public housing. It mm-hmm. always ends up in failure. It corrupts the neighborhood. It uh, degrades the neighborhood. I mean, it, ter- it leads to crime. It leads, I mean, it's, it leads to drugs, leads to all the, I mean, this was not only done in Roosevelt, too. It was done in Baltimore, where Robin lived, and in D.C., in Detroit, Chicago. It was done all over the country, or at least in the north. Mm-hmm. And it has the same impact everywhere, which is people who are not used to being with other people don't mix w- well, and it they end up clashing. So to just simply say, wealth, you know, uh, middle class black people moved in, so white people moved out, is to leave out the middle. And I think that you leave out the middle because you supported the government decisions. You cheerleaded those in the. If you're a journalist, you cheerleaded these decisions. Yes, yes, bring all of these um, uh, poor families into the suburbs, and it right. failed miserably. And you're not going to take accountability for your mess. You're going to instead turn to the victims who are the people who were driven out because um, th- this uh, there's a kid. I told you, Fillmore, that there's a kid, a guy in the history of Howard Stern. His name is uh, Milton Little mm-hmm. and uh, he's a black guy. Now, I said to, to Fillmore, there's no way he was friends with Howard Stern no. because he's the only one out of everyone who knew Howard, allegedly, who says – Howard was hysterical, the funniest kid I ever knew. You knew he was going places. He just had something about him where you wanted to follow him. He was a leader. No one says that. All of them say, oh, no, he wasn't funny. He he wasn't uh, noteworthy. He was shy. He was um, introverted. Yeah, introverted. Very, very. Yeah. It flies in the face of everything else Colford says in the book, in addition to what other people's recollections is in the history of Howard Stern. And even... Um, people he's had on the show that he knew back then, that they, yeah. they confirmed that he was a sh- shy kid, basically. Yeah, and when Howard names his black friend, it's Alan. It's not Milton. Yeah. So um, anyway, it's 
seems very apparent to me. You didn't know Howard. You might have known of Howard, but you didn't know him. But anyway, yeah. what Milton claims is that when blacks became the majority at the school, they said to him, you need to choose to be among, among blacks only. If you're around whites, we're going to beat you up, is what his, is what his claim is. Yeah. And so he said, all right, well, goodbye, guys. Uh, I know I grew up with you, but that's it. And so there were some others who were uh, who were from that ch- the childhood days who say it was sad losing him, but he did. Mm. He turned on his friends and left yes. to go and join. And actually, I want to read something to you to show you just how fragile the bond between black and white friends were in the 1960s that I think this illustrates really well just how easy it is to break break that bond. And this is edited slightly just for length. I had gone to school with whites all my life. I was the only black kid in my kindergarten class. It never occurred to me that my color should make a difference, so it didn't. No one told me that I was supposed to be stupid because I was black. No one told me that I couldn't succeed. They always expected the same kind of work from me that they got from other kids, and I performed well. I was very popular with all of my teachers except that old crone, Mrs. Green, and even that I didn't think was a race thing. The black kids who came to my school long after I'd been there seemed to be the ones with the problem. Every time a new black kid joined the class, I'd have to bring them into the group. The older the black kids were when they joined a class, the less likely they were to ever play with whites. Then one day, one of my white friends showed me that I was different. Stephanie and I had been in the same class since we were five. We were never close, but we always spoke, and we shared a common love of the Beatles music. On a Saturday, I saw Stephanie at the shopping center walking with someone I didn't know. Hi, Stephanie, I called out when I saw her. No answer. I was getting closer and assumed she hadn't heard me. Hi, Stephanie, I said, now almost on top of her. This time, there was a very visible response. Stephanie turned her nose up and tossed her hair back. She was very obviously refusing to acknowledge me. She and her friend continued to talk, walking right past me without a backward glance. I couldn't believe that this had just happened. I had even traded Beatles cards with that bitch. For years, I had been (laughs) urging black kids not to believe what they'd heard about whites. Now this girl who knew me very well had ignored me, and I could only think of one reason for the slight. I was black. Okay, so that's the way it's going to be. You'll stick to your group, and I'll stick to mine. No more living this fairy tale world where everyone gets along. It was over. I was entering my black radical period. I came to believe (laughs) that there was no way for blacks and whites to live together. My solution to every problem became kill whitey. So you know where (laughs) this comes from. This is from the Quivers of Life. Quivers of Life, yep. I probably have the audio still, too. Robin grew up with all Jewish people. And she didn't know that they were all Jewish people until she was a little older when she said she used to love Jewish holidays because it would be her and a substitute teacher only. And she got to relax during the day. So all it took for a, a girl who had only grown up with white people, who had always treated her nicely, who'd always been fair to her, was for someone to not talk to her when they saw her in public, for her to turn on the entire race the way Howard was against Japanese people. She was against white people. So mm-hmm. anyway, I find it fascinating the that parallels. The, the parallels going on, H- Robin is Milton Little in a way, like, okay, well, goodbye, I don't want to be around you guys anymore. But that also, Robin, enti- Robin owes her entire livelihood to Jewish people, to yes. Howard Stern, to, to um, Don Buckwald, Don Buckwald and Mel Carpenter. But uh, anyway, I found it fascinating that in, in, in two different cities, both were having the population change with more black people come in. And you see what happens when Robin is in the majority. Suddenly she reveals who she really is. I hate all of you. So anyway, I thought. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they, both ad- they both adapt extremely well. Also, I wanted to add in the Time Magazine article, the, uh, the author, Kurt Anderson, he says that, you know, Howard claims to be this liberal or liberal family. And he categorizes Howard more as a Reagan he calls him a classic Reagan Democrat. Now, Howard, we realize, has no political leanings kind of whatsoever. He kind of just goes with the flow. But when it comes to financials, Howard doesn't lean towards welfare systems and doesn't Howard like hates welfare, hates, yeah. hates public policy when it comes to social programs. He hates them. Yes, yeah. he uh, hates someone, them. When you get a chance, can you play that Letterman thing? Because it. It's Howard doing the beginning and end version of blacks move in, whitey moves out. And um, 
he reveals a few things in that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you feel like that's skipping ahead too much. But he reveals a few things in that that are, for the first time ever, we hear these things. But it's focusing on this particular era of... Oh. Okay. Well, we're actually going to go right through them, and this this was this sure. was a we took the scenic route, but this is what <laughs> where it's going to go, and it's going to tie into the sixty minutes, um, the Ed Bradley thing. So this one's okay. called these. Okay. This clip is called Three These Kids Were Angry Man for Whatever." The stern stayed until he was in high school because his mother believed in integration. This town was a horrible place to live. It was a nightmare. Because you were a minority. Because I was a minority. And that stern says left him isolated and alone. And my mother wanted to prove a point. My mother said, we cannot run from black people. Mm -hmm. But the problem was my mom stayed in the house all day and she sent me into Roosevelt High School. Mm -hmm. And that, I had a whole different experience. I was Okay, just gonna cut it up for a uh, you know what, guys, guys, so hold on. I was a kid and I had to fend for myself. I mean, I'd be sitting in a classroom and a guy would just turn around and bam, punch me right in the face. In the classroom? In the classroom. For what? For being white or just for for whatever for, for anger i mean these kids were angry man i can't believe i still to this day because we did a whole 60 minutes we call it the 60 minute 34 plus 60 uh when robin uh, gets jealous about the uh, this the thing and that she talks about it's you, you should listen to that episode it's one of our early ones and i think one of our best and um i can't believe that ed lets him skate on that who is a minority and who went through all kinds of shit as a journalist in that in that yeah. era you know can you well, only imagine <laughs> well, um, in 1993, in Time Magazine, uh, which dis which of these descriptions do you think applies to Howard Stern uh, is demeaning to blacks and other minorities? 61% of people mm -hmm. think. 61% <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. of people think Howard is demeaning to blacks and other minorities. So mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, also, you got remember that in private parts of the book, he claims that the person was Polish who punched him for being Jewish. Oh, yes. But he tells out Bradley it was black, a black person punching me for being white. But this then is interesting. It, change, it changes depending on the year, actually. It, it flip flops. It, it becomes like it's almost like a seesaw of racism. The next clip is called Garbage Pail Yids. <laughs> But for Howard, it was harder because going to school, he met these kids that came from the city and they were rough and tough and he would be accosted as far as money. But the only time that he, as far as I knew, was ever hit was with a garbage pail and he's spoken of that. And that really did happen. Okay, so we've got Who the garbage cares? Well, no, well, honestly, it, no, but it's it's to it's to refute the whole I was beaten up because he goes yeah. into that on the Netflix thing. And when you listen, I've been in a, not too many fights in my life, but I can tell you I could pretty much choreograph each one for you. That's how vivid they are and how they were in my life, because you don't normally it's not it's not something you do regularly unless you're I don't know, a UFC fighter or something <laughs> either way or a boxer. But in in this case, he he's never consistent with the fucking story. And then never. when you listen to it originally on the radio, cause he will go through it, you hear the garbage can thing. But then later on, when you keep saying oh, I was beaten up by black people and then the Ed Bradley thing, for Christ's sake of all places on 60 minutes to completely wipe that, wipe that out and make it even worse than it really was. You were shoved into a garbage pail once. No, no, okay. no. He wasn't shoved into one. One was, was thrown shoved in his direction. One right. was oh, thrown right. in his direction. He might not have I, even been the target. Right. It's just like, okay. But just to show you how rare that occurrence was in his life, mm -hmm. the second Ray Stern found out about that, she went to the dean of boys to confront, to say, what's going on? So it, if Howard was truly getting whipped with chains daily and coming home with no slacks on, <laughs> as he claims, she would have been there the next day telling the dean of Bo boys – you owe my son some slacks and what oh, yeah. the hell is going on? Here? Yeah. There's no way she would let her little prince, uh, get beat up if she could have, if she, she knew about it and there's no way he was going to be stoic and keep, you know, taking uh, no, shots not, in the head and then no not tell her whatsoever. Full fucking shit. I read things about your childhood that I found frankly stunning and unpleasant. Was this hyperbolic or was this accurate? That, that my childhood was unpleasant? Yes. Raised like veal. Yeah. Well, um, 
Yeah, I was raised like a veal. It's very confusing, my childhood. It's not confusing at all. It's only confusing when you're at your task to remember it because you've made up so much bullshit in your life and uh, you're, you, you know, being called on it and you're on, you're being filmed. And so there's a clip that one of the clips I'm going to play from this is also the, I was a beaten up bullshit. Mm -hmm. So let me cue that up as well. And let's see if I got this Who is right. responsible for the like a veal line he's gotten a million miles out of? Oh, shit loads. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's not. It's got to be it, Jackie. How many times do you need to go with that same line? It's got to be Jackie or it's got to be um, uh, Ratso. Oh. The information, and I don't know the chronology of this, but you claim to have been beaten up quite a lot. Is that true? Yeah, that is. I had a lot of fights. Um, Roosevelt, Long Island, was a very strange community uh, that I grew up in. And it taught me a lot, taught me everything. It completely molded who I was. And, you know, it, it was a white community. And it was uh, Jewish and Italian and, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden, it was one square mile, this town. Now, I want you to pay close attention, guys, to the crazy eyes that start happening here. That's and so funny that you would say that because, I don't, sorry to cut yep. you off, but I was going to say, this is, this should be studied for body language for lie detection. He mm -hmm. can't look at Letterman in the eyes and his eyes are going crazy, bouncing yes. around. Yes. Oh, yeah. And this is, and he'd already been told to take off the sunglasses because, and that's one of the key things. He always wants that hidden because he knows mm -hmm. he's going to get called out for being a fraud or somebody's going to suss it out. He really needs sunglasses for all interviews or else this happens mm -hmm. every time. And real estate agents would do a thing back in that day called blockbusting. What they would try to do is move a black family in. And if you put a black family on a block, Whitey would move right out the door. And uh, lo and behold, in the middle of the night, this is how crazy it was. In the middle of the night, a black family would move in. And I say literally the middle of the night. White people didn't want their neighbors to know they had sold to a black family. And what would happen is uh, in the middle of the night, white, white family would move out. And the next day, a black family would be there. Okay, so this this actually gets refu uh, this actually gets confirmed by other people in the history of Howard Stern. So I have no reason to doubt that well, that I, was here, a pro was a situation. I'm sure it did happen. Here's what I no. uh, doubt: blockbusting ever happened, and I'll tell you why. First of all, my trust for the media is at the lowest it has ever been, and I work in the media. I have worked in the media for 20 years, but um, it is at the lowest it has ever been. And it has encouraged me to question everything I've ever been told as truth. So last night I go, let me look up what blockbusting was. I mm -hmm. had looked it up before, but I wanted to read it again. And it, the claim is that real estate agents would come in, um, tell somebody, look, uh, a black, black people are moving in your neighborhood. Um, they would hire a black person, a woman to like push her her uh, stroller down the street and leave their card in the mail, like a mailbox saying, right. contact me. They would um, hire a black man to drive down the street with his car playing music loudly and put a thing in the mail uh, saying, contact me. And then they would uh, tell these homeowners, we're going to offer you less money than your home is worth because uh, this black uh, tidal wave is coming your way. And right. then they would turn around and sell it to black people. Now, I read through the Wikipedia thing. And I saw that when they would leave, you know, make their citations of mm -hmm. here's the book that this was in and here's the book that this was in. Mm -hmm. But the grandfather of all of this is a Saturday Evening Post article that came out in 1962 called Confessions of a Blockbuster. So okay. I say, let me go to the source material. I started sure. reading it. Within three paragraphs, I said, this is fake. This okay. is electric eel. This is electric eel. So, you know, when you see something that is too perfect you that you immediately should go wait a minute this sounds so anyway i googled who is this person okay the person is a pseudonym there is no person by that name the person who uh said who, who claims that this story was told to them was contacted by black homeowners saying uh we would like to know the name of this person because we believe we've been ripped off and we would like to contact this person mm -hmm. the, the the person said I don't have to tell you their name, free speech. So they take it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, 
He doesn't have to tell you the person's name, free speech. And so journalists everywhere go, yay, free speech. So if you don't think that something that is sensational like this was with its fake pictures, I guarantee you they're fake. They didn't just happen to catch a black person looking over their shoulder as two white people are moving out. They, I guarantee you it's fake. Um, every book, including every item in that Wikipedia article, is taken from that story. The story that whose author we'll never know, who um, uh, that, that doesn't supply any real, you know, here, here's uh, um, a real person who's on the record saying, yes, I did do this. So anyway, yellow journalism, general, yellow journalism is a thing. And in the 1960s, Saturday Evening Post was suffering in readership. And I wholeheartedly believe that this fantastic tale of how could you possibly scare Roosevelt when they already were 20% black by hiring a black woman to push a stroller down the street. Mm -hmm. How could you possibly? You know, I already have black neighbors. Why would I be scared of that sight? So um, anyway, the story Howard just told is from the Wikipedia entry on blockbusting. No one in it, never in his history has he ever claimed blockbusters came. No one ever came. The only blockbuster we know about is the award that he received for best newcomer. <laughs> but no one has ever claimed... I'm sorry, I should be looking at you, Sam. I wasn't looking. That, uh, and I'll finish up here. No one has ever claimed that a real estate agent came up to them and said, "You're, you know, uh, how you have one out of every five. Well, there's another black person about to move in, so you should sell." This is a very um, acceptable way to, once again, not blame the government for putting in a bad policy of sending welfare recipients to your neighborhood, but to instead blame imaginary evil agents and whitey. Uh, also, on July 16, 2021, on the New York Post, Wikipedia co-founder says site is now propaganda for left-leaning establishments. <laughs> I saw that yesterday. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, Wikipedia co-founder Larry Sanger has warned the website can no longer be trusted, insisting it is now just propaganda for left-leaning establishments. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Well, well no, we, we, Wiki, I, Wikipedia I, I, is not Encyclopedia Britannica, guys. It never no, was. No, no, I mean, it's, yeah, like, yeah. But that's just so, more to I, the point of Benjamin. Yeah, no, I understand. So what, I, what I wanted to do was say, uh, what would the activists turn to as proof? What would the um, academics turn to as proof? They right. all value Wikipedia. So let me go and look what Wikipedia says. Now, if you can't prove any of these claims that were written by a fake person, um, that merely having a black woman walk down the street was enough to panic people who were already in an integrated neighborhood, right. um, then I'm going to say I don't believe it existed. Um, oh, I, I thoroughly, I, th I don't believe block bus busting existed. It's a concept that was, it was created somehow, but I do believe, I do believe it's possible that, uh, for organic reasons, a neighborhood changes because we've seen it happen definitely. in oh, many, definitely. you know, it's, it's entirely possible, but not for the reasons he wants you, he would have you believe obviously. Right. right. I, yeah. I think the sensationalism of how he's saying it changes yeah. is different from how it actually changes. Yes. Yeah, I've heard him I've heard him say this was the first time I've ever heard him say blockbusting. But I've also really? heard him say, yes, it's the first time. It's not written in Colford's book. It's not written in private parts. It's um so in America we have a renewed and seemingly endless appetite for stories of racism, of um uh, uh, of evil scheming of f afraid, frightened whiteies and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that you'll notice is when Howard tells his stories of abuse at the hands of black people, it's okay for him to tell that story so long as he concludes with, and that's why I hate whitey, which is what he always does. Right. He always blames white people for his plight. Right. Now it wasn't. So, so you're in this, you know, this situation where, wait a minute, your parents, took you out of that neighborhood because you were beaten up. Um, why do you allow that for yourself and not for other people? You know, mm -hmm. why, why do you not forgive someone else who says, look, I'm not paying all these taxes to give welfare families free lunch at the expense of library books and so on. Or in 1968, when Martin Luther King gets shot and the riot goes through and burn down my business, uh, which Paul Colfer talks about. Three businesses burned down. Uh, someone was stabbed. Stabs, 200 whites, yeah. 200 black, 200 blacks rampaged down the street and attacked, attacked whites. That's in Colfer's book. 
This was not unique to Roosevelt either. This happened for that week after MLK was assassinated. But that is a very important middle that's left out of blacks move in, whites move out. Well, Sam? it's this it's the same flagrant language that he uses when he talks about the Rodney King situation, which he should have been beaten more, or he, this inflammatory language. Howard is free to say whatever he wants or frame a narrative however he wants because he he doesn't live in these neighborhoods anymore. He is he is not affected. The last time race touched him, the last time race really touched him, uh, and I don't mean Alan, uh, you know, bent over a bunch of unused playboys <laughs> um, in his in his parents' house. I'm talking about, uh, let's say, the kids. Like Ashley really loves, Rub, Rub, what's his name, uh, Ruben Usher. Stuttered, you know, or Usher, or a push picture of whoever on the fucking, like, you know, oh, they like this guy on the a poster of this big black, you know, rapper on the fucking, on the wall or whatever. That's, and, and he, ma he had made it a point to say, oh, that's interesting. Why would you even mention it? If it wasn't something you were concerned with, you know what I mean? And oh, so it's on his he, mind all the it's time. Constantly. Race is always on his mind. But it, you're right. The, in terms of like uh, social unrest, r the racial dis uh, disharmony has never been an issue for him. And even back then, it was an issue. Ben, you and I both, well, we, you, you theorized many times that the people were not, <laughs> they were not a, 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 like actively pursuing him because he was white. It's because he was a dork. He might have been like seen as gay, uh, and uh, I mean, and he's just a clearly yeah. like a target. He just paint a target on his back for many reasons. Yeah. Um, if word got around that this guy gives hand jobs <laughs> in the basement, <laughs> these guys might not have liked that. They might not have liked no. seeing Alan heading over to the house of the guy who gives hand jobs. That's right. Um, but there's an Alan story in this clip that you have. Yep. Yep. We're gonna play the rest of it, and then we'll take a little break panic into white people and most of these people would you would call them white liberals but these white liberals talk one way oh i love my black brothers they're wonderful next thing you know they're selling the house in the middle of the night and they're moving out and so this little community this mostly white community ended up being 97 percent black and puerto rican 97 percent black and puerto rican is his new addition to this story when yes. did you ever hear him talk about all the blacks of Puerto Ricans? Never. Puerto Ricans were not part of these the 1960s civil rights thing where we're going to bus inner city Puerto Ricans. In. No, that, that, there, that, were, there, were, there were no Latino. It was no Latino. I mean, there might have been like incremental. There might have been yeah, like a, incrementally a, a, like a, there yeah. might have been a minute percentage that was. But I doubt it highly. There's just no way. Uh, and 60, 40 is not 97 percent. Sorry. No, you. it's not. It's not. Sam, please. You're not cutting me off. I just let, let's listen to how much he's loved Puerto Ricans, by the way. Anytime there's a celebration for any sort of <laughs> Latina, he true. hates any like he you think about any minority, anything to do with Puerto Ricans, Latinas, any sort of that. He has dis, the most dismissive of any minority. <laughs> Howard. He, he devoted he devoted pages in private parts about Filipinos and how he hated their you know he hated them so mm -hmm. it's not is not mm -hmm. Mr. Racially Tolerant. Um, they wanted to stay in the community. They you know my mother was like we are not afraid of black skin. I go well you don't leave the house. I'm going to school, <laughs> and I'm the only I'm one of three white kids in this school and I got to tell you it's terrifying because it was a very weird time in this country's history. You had uh, the civil rights movement. Martin, the day Martin Luther King got shot, my mother got a call from several of her black friends and said, keep Howard home. And she got on that phone and she said, I'm not keeping him home. We're going to school. We are going to school. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, again, you're going to you're going to hear point counterpoint guys where it was he was fine. Like he was, you know, it might have been a, a politically charged time, but he really wasn't affected by it. So. Listen to him painting the thing. Oh, you like I was fearful of blacks. Like basically saying I'm afraid of black people. And, I, and I, don't find, like, did, I didn't hear one funny one funny sentiment out of any of this. Did you? No, no. I'm not even joking. Not even. I don't care what politi political leading you have. I didn't hear a goddamn funny thing come out of his mouth yet. It's quite different. It, it, it's quite sorry. Sorry, Ben. It's quite different from the narrative he paints from previous articles as cited by Colford in the book in which he said he, he he qualifies it by saying look 
I understand that for a lot of for black people in the country, it was a very rough time, and like there might have been some mis- displaced anger going out at people who were not, you know, really they shouldn't have been targeting, but that he, it was very conciliatory uh, tone the way he makes it sound. But then subsequently, every fucking time, it's you know we did that roast, the uh, Channel Nine roast, where he had footage of the nineteen like like some some nineteen twenties uh, Harlem neighborhood, and he said that's where I lived. You know that's what it was like. And yeah. it, obviously, it's meant as a joke, but doesn't play very well if you want to ever come off as not being racist. And, and if Letterman was paying attention, he should have said, "Okay, so ninety seven percent of your school was black or Puerto Rican." <laughs> and there were and there were three whites. So you had a hundred students at your school, because <laughs> that's how the numbers work out. Yeah, he didn't have a hundred students at his school. His school was overcrowded by one thousand people, according yeah. to Colbert's book. That's, that's right. how overcrowded it was. So yep. and, uh, so it's you know like sixty forty, black white was split at that time. One out of every three of the black students was on welfare. Yes. So it's. It's infuriating to me. H- Howard obviously has contempt for people on welfare who take advantage of any social welfare. By take advantage, I mean use any social program. And he takes it out on uh, High Pitch Eric, Ass Napkin Ed, Joey Boots, Bigfoot, um, Jeff the Drunk, yep. Wendy. Any, anyone who receives public assistance, he has contempt for. And obviously... His psychologist, if he was on the ball, could say, do you suppose that the reason why you hate, quote, phony liberals, phony white liberals, and why you hate people who are on public assistance uh, is because that public assistance ruined your childhood in a way? It drove your friends away. It drove your neighborhood deterioration. It overcrowded your schools. It made you leave. Uh, You know, there's an argument to be made there. I mean, I don't think there's much, I don't think that is the argument that the, the school, the, the, the area was ruined because, and the principal even said, the superintendent even said so. We, we, we can't sustain all of these um, public Programs. housing program coming to our, yeah. to our neighborhood. We can't afford it. It's right. taxing. Mm-hmm. So, but it's interesting that he leaves that part out and just makes it be the presence of blacks alone drive white people away. <laughs> Pretty much. Sam? <laughs> But then, you know, growing up in this liberal household, he goes on to say, you said about Rodney King, they didn't beat this guy enough. Do you worry that something you say on air as a joke or a certain amount of irony that your audience might just take that as gospel? Howard says, Rodney King should have been beaten more. I think Rodney King is a blight on society. Rodney King was going over a hundred miles an hour drunk. This guy is a fucking danger. If Rodney King drove down my block and drove up on a sidewalk and hit my kid, I take out a fucking gun and blow his goddamn brains out. Do I worry about what an audience reaction is going to be? Absolutely not. You have to assume that they're reasonably intelligent enough to know that a guy on the radio shouldn't be formulating every opinion of theirs. I can give a shit what's the audience reaction is going to be. I just hope they keep tuning in. (laughs) So that, so you, so is, so were they so liberal? And I mean, were they, so that's it. So that's the disconnect for me. Like, were they so liberal that he was allowed to keep having these super racist opinions? No, because um, Bill O'Reilly, when he interviewed Howard, there's an excerpt of this in the history of Howard, which I revisited just this section just before this, this week, where Bill O'Reilly says, your father, conservative man, Howard goes, uh, he voted for Republicans and he voted for Democrats. Uh, but he goes, but, but socially he was, he was liberal. Now, um, that, that's something that you usually don't get played up. Usually don't you call yourself liberal if you vote for Republicans. Yeah. Um, no. So, and Howard has always, has always said, I vote for Republicans. I vote for Democrats. That's another reason why Ben Stern might want to leave. Look, I would rather go somewhere where they share my political values, which is why he, you know, he ends up in another all-white neighborhood. Not another, the first all-white neighborhood. Yes, but at the same time, they're going to give you the argument that it was too rough for Howard. That's why we had to leave. Like Howard well, was the one bearing the brunt of it. To, yeah, but, but who's but I going mean, to say? Uh, 
who's going to say the real reason? I mean, they're they're going to always choose the um, well. I mean, route. I mean, we, we we can only we can only presume. Uh, but I mean, yeah. in 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 actual fact, um, if there is, if, I mean, most people. If they can, they always want to live somewhere they think is better. Perception trumps, Definitely. you know. It, Definitely. So in the, in this case, uh, they want to maybe a bigger house, a nicer house, a nicer neighborhood, an older neighborhood, perhaps more de- yep. deciduous growth. You know, long, you yep. know, older trees. Like I mean, people right. play it. It does it does play a factor into where people live as well. Well, of and, course. I mean, you yeah. know, the average person. What is it like? Five years that the average homeowner stays with the house and then moves. So no, these guys, maybe it's seven years. But no these guys were there for. Okay, but in America, it's like that. Five to seven, something yeah. like that. Yeah. These guys Anecdotally, were there for 15 years, and, and Ben Stern was making much more money by the end. He owned a business by the end. He could afford to live. Why should he be bound to stay right. there just to prove he's not racist? I went to school, and uh, I got news for you. I, I got the shit beat out of me. Now, did you make friends in that community? Uh, it was difficult. I did make one friend. Lovely guy named Alan. I was. A, I, Did you see those eyes pop oh, out? Oh yeah. Like they were. Oh my oh, yeah. lord. So I, I'm. A, I'm. A, I looked it up ages ago. It it in, indicates uh, the shifty eyes indicates well a few things, but one of the the main um, concepts is that it indicates a lo- uh, looking for an escape. And I'm thinking to myself, looking for an escape from what the question, looking at escape from the truth. Mm. What is it? What exactly is it indicating uh, besides someone who just seems untrustworthy? I mean, that's the the yeah. normal, you know, that's what the, the average Joe would think. I I would also suggest that it could be uh, uh, hereditary with him. This this uh-huh. whole eye twitching thing, uh-huh. which um, is I think uh, supported by the fact that. Scott Possessor, for example, says that when you drove in the car with Howard, you took your life in your hands because yeah. he has no depth perception. Now okay. that is a that the no depth perception, and you know Howard always says I can't even clip my own nails. Right. Um, that is linked to that eye condition. Okay. So um, it, I, I believe that the eye condition is, you know, for the most honest man in the world, you're forbidden from addressing that. That you mm-hmm. cannot joke about his eye condition, can't acknowledge that it, that it's there. Uh-huh. So anyway, uh, I I tend to think while I love this and it falls right in line with him being a compulsive liar, mm-hmm. I also think that it might be dep- regardless of what he's discussing. If he's telling right. you the weather outside, it could still be doing that. We I wanted you to listen to the Richie Wilson interview we uh, did about oh, let's see now um, eight thirty episodes ago, and in it when we asked him about the crazy eyes, he said outright we had real problems because we could not, there's, there's times we could not match the footage and we'd have to include them because there'd be no cutaway. Robin was not there. Fred was doing live reads somewhere or, you know, was looking down. And so there'd be no matching footage that he could like an extra bit of footage to cover up the fact that he was doing the darting eye thing and he didn't mm-hmm. have his glasses on or he had the sunglasses on, but you could still see them through the glasses mm-hmm. and they were mm-hmm. under a directive to get rid of that every time they could. Uh, I believe by him, uh, but uh, they said there are some times where we had no choice but to air it because they had just no other footage to cover yeah. it up with. And this is probably one of his worst nightmares because he, without the glasses, they're out on display and it oh, always yeah. just makes him look worse. I mean, and, yeah. and the hair, you're right, Sam, between the hair and the eyes, like hair is more visual, eyes are visual too, but less of an issue. It's, and if he does have a real eye issue, why would anybody feel... Um, like that was something that needed to be covered. Robin discussed how awful a driver he was. And so did Gary years and years ago that he was, he would cry because he couldn't find his way through Manhattan. <laughs> so anyway, so, so. but no, the eyes are the issue too, because you could see how he can't walk downstairs. I mean, it was, oh, it yes. was on display during yes. the Ellen episode where oh, yeah. he needed Beth's help to walk down just right, a yeah. little tiny step. She needed to carry grandpa down the stairs. Oh yeah. So. I honestly don't, if you put the juxtaposition of the hair issue where he constantly says my hair, my hair, my hair all the time when it's clearly fake hair, mm-hmm. I don't understand why he constantly puts his fake hair front and center. I mean, I would <laughs> avoid that topic altogether, but he puts it on display all the time versus this eye issue which is obvious, but he never talks about it. It's just a yeah. weird juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah. I, and when he talks about the glasses, the sunglasses, it's always, 
I thought it would make my nose look smaller. Now, whoever saw Jim, <laughs> whoever saw Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles and said, those men have such small noses. <laughs> no yeah. one ever makes that remark. <laughs> oh, your nose is so small. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's his imitation comedy deflection. Yeah. So you, you, you deflect with imitation comedy um, so that we don't harp on these glasses anymore. Jackie conjectured that it was, and it might be a little self-serving on Jackie's part, but he said that he also did not want uh, to have make it seem as though he was read, read, looking at a note any time he was reading a joke, because it's not like he had the ability to look at something really quick, memorize it, and say it on the fly. He had to have that piece of paper in front of him, and if his eyes are that bad, you'd, it'd be very obvious, the reading, you know. But then in the 80s, I, yeah, he, had, he, okay. had, he had... He had real reading glasses on. He yes. had, you know, your regular run-of-the-mill glasses on. He looked like a dad. Yeah, like he an accountant. He looked like his dad. Regular... He looked, had Ben Stern glasses on. Right. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I, yeah. So I really don't understand, honestly, why he brings so much attention to fake hair that we can all <laughs> see. But then we can also see the crazy eyes, but he doesn't ever address that issue. It's too painful, I would assume. I, I mean, he'd I much think... rather talk about the penis size that he'll never show you than yes. the thing that's right there on his face that you can, you're not allowed to discuss. But it's also sleight of hand. Like, if I'm mentioning this, it's a deflection. Yes. You, can, you can definitely, like, now you, you've forgotten all about my hair looking like a Brillo pad. Or yeah. uh, you've forgotten about the fact that my eyes are darting like a, 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 like a sped-up video of Pong. Um, I never thought about this, but just yeah. for a second, imagine day one of filming private parts and Betty and Ivan say to themselves, oh, my God, what's with his eyes? This is going to be <laughs> this is going to double the budget. We're wasting film. We, have to, we can't use that take. Right. <laughs> God. What did they so, do? Seriously, what did they do? They didn't do a lot of straight on angles. They did not have him face the camera as much. It was often like profile shots of him talking to Mary McCormick. It was him with management. Uh, the hair poofed up, covered around, you know, which is how we kind of, in 2006, the way he had the Brillo hair, the Brillo wig, like closing either side of his eyes, which is really great for someone who can't see to put or more obstacles in front of them. Yeah. Or do you think because he was reading and memorizing and not on the fly stern, the eyes were less darty because I, he I was say, less uh, lying. Q I would say though that if it's hereditary, I mean, if it's if it's genetic, then I mean maybe maybe it's um, um, inflamed by stress or whatever. But I, I do think it's involuntary. So I don't yeah. think that it's um, you know whether or not he's telling the truth. Hmm. I don't know. Sometimes you can absolutely see him staring straight ahead. So I, I, I think it's, it's totally rea It's, it's a, it's, it's involuntary when he's lying. Uh, and, but uh, you know, we'll never know, I guess it's all conjecture. Like, I, I like mean, a lot it of the would show. be, it would be the worst poker face in the world. If it's truly <laughs> tied to lying. I mean, that's why he should be studied then. If that's, if it's truly tied we, to, to lying. The yeah. only way we would know is if we would get the B-roll of every... We would have to get completely unfiltered footage of the E-show yes. and just say, yeah. give it to us straight, and then we would know. Otherwise, yeah. we're just... This is just pure conjecture. We'll uh, never right. know. Right. Give us the footage of him responding to the, 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 the Howard footage specifically of him yeah, talking no, to Jay Thomas. No cuts. Anytime no, Jay I, Thomas I, I was in studio though, asking him about shit. <laughs> go, yeah, go ahead. I feel as though, and I'll, I won't harp on this anymore, you could look to just footage of him listening and his eyes are doing that. So yes. he's not talking. He's just listening and his eyes mm -hmm. are doing that. So uh, that's why I think it's an involuntary, um, you know, uh, an eye problem that he actually has, well, which affects his discussion? depth perception. If the discussion's making him uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be multiple reasons why he does it, and and all valid in, in, in the same way as well. Right. Anyway, let's continue. I used to like to play chess, and we were going to go to my house and play chess. And um, we started <laughs> walking the house, and a, a gang of kids came up to us and, said, and asked him where he was going. He said, I'm going to his house. They beat the hell out of him, beat the hell out of me. Uh, he, took a, he took a bad beating. And he beat the hell out of him, beat the hell out of me. He took a bad beating. That It's, it's one of the worst... The, the dumbest ways to explain how you yourself got injured 
but you focus exactly. you double you double down on Allen getting twice. You mentioned that he got beat up, did, meaning you, that's to deflect it away I, from yourself because you didn't get fucking beat up at all. That's you honed in honed in on exactly my takeaway from that too. Who tells a story about getting their ass kicked and makes that an aside? Like, you know, they they beat up my friend Emmy. They beat up my friend. You don't just throw <laughs> yeah, in so, and me. Um, uh, so, uh, you want to know what I took away from this? I thought he learned how to play chess as an adult. And he... <laughs> well, that's why I, I said took... play chess is code. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He told us that chess was something he learned as an adult. And that's why he started having those chess oh, lessons no. and then played online. He wasn't playing chess. Playing well, chess it... is code for... Putting on a thong and slow dancing to the Goo Goo Dolls in the basement. Yeah, with Alan. Oh. And that's what he and Alan were, were up to. Up to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. And yeah. um, he said, you, well, you, don't, you don't call your friend lovely, by the way, <laughs> like, which is what he <laughs> called Alan. Lovely guy. I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to um, Mark S., who sent me a, a, a video capture of him talking to Mark Harris in, you know, you know, the heyday of Mark Harris and saying to Mark something along the lines of no straight man uses the word gorgeous. And then he brought together a clip of him talking about more present day, talking about Bruce, uh, Brad Pitt saying, look, Brad Pitt is gorgeous. Oh, wow. You know, he says fabulous all the time, too. Oh, yes. Which used yeah. to be just be a joke that fabulous right. is a gay word. Yeah. I always I always refer back to my father like. Would my father say this? And the answer is no, because my father is straight. So if my father would never say lovely friend gorgeous. or gorgeous <laughs> mm -hmm. or fabulous, fabulous. I've yeah. never heard the three words come out of his you mouth. You know what I always thought, too, is when he started saying, referring to men, talking about their tits. I always yes. thought that was alarming. Right. What? Um with with men with men the way I always heard it was you you don't say tits you would you might say bitch tits but you yeah, won't say right. tits as an insult but you don't as say an about insult. It, like yeah big um, fat belly and tits and he's so that the guys that is we're not going to go down that road because that is a whole saga of body dysmorphia that we're going to get into at some point in the future. Yeah. No thank and, you. But, yeah. Yeah. But I do want to point out that um in private parts he says Alan was beaten up for hanging out with a honky and yeah. in the history of Howard Stern, Ray says they beat up Alan, and that's why we moved. N at no point do they say they beat up Howard. Right. And, and now he just throws that in. Right, and that's why these clips are going to be played. I can't do this, you know. It was sad. And it was a after, mess. after this, you went to high school? This was not high school. Well, my it? parents moved, and then, we, uh, then I, I went into 10th grade, and I was in culture shock. We moved to a white neighborhood, and it was a disaster for me. Turns out, not only didn't black people like me, white people didn't like me. <laughs> I realized it wasn't a racial thing. Oh, there was something wrong with me. Well, that's true. If that's, but, the, uh, <laughs> if that's the case, then why did they beat up Alan? I think um, that it was they they were on to something that Howard if that was if that was the situation, I think they were on to something Howard and Alan were doing. Yes. Pulse I, I've said before, I don't think that they were racist. I think they were homophobic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, Howard talks about the rhinoceros penises, you know, in private parts. They have they show Howard just ogling the penises as they walk past him in a parade fashion, which I'm um, certain he wanted to in he insert that in the film. He wanted that in there. Yeah. Right. Can we can I start playing myself at age 17 or <laughs> exactly? <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to play this. And, and isn't it odd that we've never heard from this Alan friend of his? I was going to ask you, you've never heard audio of him on the show ever in the archives and just, you know, perusing I, stuff. I haven't never? heard, I haven't heard any other person reference him aside from the Stern parents and, and Howard, but the kids don't reference Alan. Uh, you know, the kids, the former kids who grew up with Howard, they reference Milton. Yeah. But I, I well, if, if, if I, I, I presume he existed, but I, 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 so I, I seem to recall a read through on Mark's com. That he visited them and visited them in studio, but this would have been like a master tape theater or something like that. And and Mark's not exactly Mark Twain when it comes to writing notes. Right. So uh, yeah, I, if I can ever find it, I'll definitely put it up on the the site and put it on my well, channel. I'd love to hear that. Me too. So I did want to bring up this quote from Rolling Stone from February tenth, nineteen ninety four. Um, 
They said, uh, you originally wanted to call your book Howard Stern Has a Small Penis. Uh, no, I wanted to call it Mein Kampf. Then my agent said, there won't be a Jew in the world who will buy that book. So then I said the title should be Penis because I thought if it went into the New York Times bestseller list, it would be Howard Stern's Penis. And they'd have to write Howard Stern's Penis is number one. What's with the penis obsession? You've likened yours to an acorn. You claim you're hung like a pimple. Uh, I think I might as well. I think I, I, I'm sorry. I can't even read this with like a straight face. I think I might as well be upfront about it. No guy will ever admit to having a small penis. I just went on the record. I might be one of the smallest guys in the world. I had a trip to the doctor when I had an anal fissure. My asshole was a mess. I'm lying there. On this doctor's table and my penis, I mean, it was inside itself like a turtle's head poking backward. It was so fucking embarrassing. Who the fuck's going to admit to something like that? And so that's great radio because it's someone being honest about their fears and emotions. I, f- yeah. I know Ben, ben, I, ben and I probably had the same thought. I hate that fucking bullshit trope of, oh, I'm admitting, I'm honest because I'm talking about my small penis, which, which I'm never going to show you. Yeah. So you yeah. can believe me because I, no man would admit to having a small dick. No man well, but Steve Dahl, who had done it first. <laughs> there you go. The other thing is, maybe he's uh, he had anal fissures from having too many fucking dicks in his ass, uh, and he yeah. doesn't want to talk about that. Yeah. Also, you know, where does that wanna... come from? Which, what's, where does what come from? Like, like, like the anal fissures, like, huh? Who brought Over-wi- that up? So, Overwiping so, no, no. is what he'll that's, tell you. That's what he'll tell you. But go yeah. and do Wikipedia. Go, go yeah. and Google what anal fissures are. It's from overstimulation back there, like putting things inside, <laughs> not from wiping too much. So, um, you know, we know for certain that in, in private parts that he was – so desperate to have Allison put fingers up his butt during sex and she wouldn't do it, that he did it to himself in the shower. Now, I don't believe that this is the first and only time he ever tried it, but you know, he's testing the waters by just testing a little bit, putting his foot in the, in the, in the waters to see, do my fans revolt if I admit to this? Right. And you know, I think he reaches a certain point where he goes, I don't feel comfortable admitting these things anymore. And now Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, I never said them. Yep. And well, they're in print, and now they're on this podcast. So here you go, guys. Guys, we go from anal fissures, we go from Roosevelt, we go from uh, white flight, and now we're going to try to get into the bullshit narrative of I was beaten up. So this is a clip from the Channel 9 show, episode 26, if you're following along, where they did a This Is Your Life mock-up, and his phys ed teacher from the first year of Roosevelt High School, or whatever, then I don't, if I get the oh. name of the high school wrong, guys, I'm, I Junior, apologize. Junior, senior high, I think it is. Yeah, exactly. I love this so much. So He looks younger than Howard. Yes, he does. Oh. You don't look so big anymore. <laughs> no, I'm not even picking. You are today, and saved your white ass many times. <laughs> That's true. It's your gym teacher from Roosevelt Junior High School, Mr. Chestnut. Mr. Chestnut, how are you? The well, only you say, gentleman on this soundstage. Well, let me tell you something. Yes, right, let me tell you something, Mr. Chestnut. It's an honor that you would come here. Did you see Johnny Mandola? I see Johnny. Do you remember Johnny? No. No, you don't know Johnny. Oh. Johnny moved out as soon as Johnny. You moved out as soon as the blacks started moving in, right? <laughs> now me. I was a good white man. In the sense, Mr. Chestnut, and I think you'll agree, I was one of the few white people who stayed in the black community of Roosevelt. As a young boy, I stayed there. I decided that race relations were very important at an early age. Actually, my parents refused to move. <laughs> but Mr. Mr. Chestnut, Chestnut, how many white kids were there in the class? This is so fucked up. First of all, I, I, he had no choice. His parents own the house he was a child so no and then he says my parents actually this is so embarrassing and look at mr chestnut sweating if i were mr chestnut i would have punched him in the face actually i would have just ripped his wig off i would have just ripped his wig off and karate kicked him in the fucking face this is so embarrassing if i wasn't seeing mr chestnut with my own eyes i would go that's a made-up name you stole it from a Charles Dickens novel or something. There was no Mr. Right. Chestnut. And yet here he right. is. Yep. Uh, I don't know how many there were in Howard's class, but there was about a 60-40 ratio. 60-40, Mr. Chestnut. 60-40. Yeah. That's, w- that's one reason why I wanted to pull this clip, because 
there's Whoa. there's if it was scripted this is why some people might th- i want to combat the idea that some people think mr chestnut is not real uh this is just made up whatever why is he bringing up that figure that completely uh obliterates howard's long oft repeated story about i was the only white guy in this neighborhood or i was the only white guy in the mm-hmm. in roosevelt left one of mm-hmm. three people I mean, we've already, we did an episode called 79 where he talks about how only 6% of the country gets into Harvard. <laughs> and we started, <laughs> we started, and Bra- Raven did the math and said it was like 19 million people would have, oh uh, God. 6% Howard is should, 19 million. Howard should just get a job with the New York Times after this. Keep going. Uh, anyway. Fine. <laughs> Who are you kidding me? Is Art Fleming black, Mr. Chestnut? Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, Mr. Chestnut, do you, Brad brings to mind a question. Do you remember any specific incidences where you had this white clown here among all the black students? Well, well, first of all, uh, he was He was That's he was true, not. Mr. Chestnut. He was very I was serious. Good boy. Very, 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 very serious. Yes. And, uh, they called him he, Howie, though. He also he? was not tall. Oh, he was? No. Okay, so that's pre pre growth spurt. But either way, we have another person refuting the um, the assertion that the one what's what's the fellow's name in the history of Howard Stern that says he was he was really funny. Milton Little. Um, Milton Little. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know th- I, this is thing I was I was hooked in. I wanted to hear what um, Mr. Chestnut was going to say about the sixty forty thing. This happens all the time, and Howard is a slippery guy. Oh. He always manages to get off the hook every single time. I mean, it happens with callers all the time, too. They'll bring up something that is an uncomfortable fact, and he will bring up his penis. Say, Mm -hmm. what is he talking about, Robin? Make some lame joke, and that means the subject is closed. We're not going to address it anymore. And we move on. That's his escape hatch. (laughs) He is blessed in that way he is oh, yeah. able to slip out of these situations the only the, and, to my to my knowledge the only person that really sort of kept him cornered like the rat is is the o'reilly interview in yeah, when he was plugging serious and you have and i'm not be, an o'reilly fan i'm not an o'reilly no, fan no. in the slightest yeah, I, yeah you don't have to be to you you uh you have to have that disposition that you are going to be that you're dealing with someone slippery most yeah. people are too kind they don't yes. want. They can see that someone is uncomfortable and is slipping, and they go, "I'm not gonna." Pr- I mean, I'm on television here. I'm not gonna hold him to this. They it takes a him. special person to, yeah, to say, have, "I don't." Yeah, yeah. They afford him every exit in most most they media do. outlets. Co- Bob Costas, well. Bill Maher. You thought for? I thought for sure when he did that book promotion tour that the the Bill Maher appearance would be. Um, Bill at least holding his feet to the fire a bit, but no, even he pussied out for the most part. There was a couple segments where he didn't, but for the most part, it was let him do his shtick. Sam, I I I agree. I, he always is like ooze. He just like mm-hmm. gets through everything. It's the Terry Gross interview. I'm like, come on, right? Just I really do think it comes down. I really do think it comes down to human beings. Inherently being kind and saying, I'm not going to make this person uncomfortable. Right. Um, but Letterman, it just baffles me because he's known him for so long that it, it for me, what I believe is one hand washes the other. Yeah. So there is so much filth on some of these people that you're, you know, my bullshit. I know yours. Mm. Shake my hand and I'm going to shake yours and we're mm. just going to do this thing and then be done with it and see you later. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to we're not going to bring up the fuck couch in the office and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. We're well, and the but, fact that Beth which, carried a ladder across the stage and whatever she was on the show before that. Yeah. Which yeah. by this point though in the during the Netflix thing and I don't want to digress into it because that's a whole other video walk yeah, we could yeah, do. Yeah. Um, he, um, he, he doesn't like, it's already out in the open, uh, the Letterman thing. So he doesn't really have that over him anymore. And Letterman pokes at the, the, the wig, take off the beard, make it the hair, or either take off the hair or take off the beard. He pokes at him a little bit and I could all, and when, as I said, when it first came out, it was only, it was one of the shortest episodes of that Netflix series. I believe the same way the comedians in cars with coffee was only like oh. 12 minutes as opposed to other people doing 20 or 25. So whatever was left on the cutting room floor, I so desperately would love to see because you know, there had to be reams of it. Dar- darting yeah. eyes, lots of yeah. darting eyes. Yes. Things um, that he just didn't want out there. He said, look, I yeah. veto that. I didn't want that. I don't want that to be part of it. Sim. But again, it's that you 
you just one hand washes the other. You put out what I want out. One hand washes the other. We're not going to get into you just promote and say whatever narrative I want put out there. Very yep. little will be said other than the narrative I'm promoting. Yep. The end. Yep. I was not tall. And then I said, listen, listen, let, listen, let me set the record straight here. Mr. Chestnut's a very <laughs> nice guy. I got no axe to grind with him. It's true when I got continually beat up, particularly around Martin Luther King's birthday and, and the assassination of Martin Luther King, it was like all hell broke loose on, on this guy. But Mr. Chestnut was always there. Did he stop? Do you remember a specific incident where you saved Howard? You could have saved me one time, Mr. Chestnut. There I was in the locker room at Roosevelt Junior Senior High School. I was walking um... around. Unbeknownst to me, some other kid threw a metal garbage pail down on my head almost. If Mr. Chestnut almost. had only stepped in, I might not be so brain damaged. <laughs> Where were you, Mr. Chestnut? I needed yeah. you. I'd like to know because how it... Uh, I guess I'm remember? senile. I don't remember that incident. <laughs> Nobody remembers I... anything about oh. Roosevelt except me. <laughs> Okay, so that Except clip was me. that clip that that clip was so valuable for so many ways, and the other the, the, and what you're really hearing, oh, of course, Wig talking about, and the sole incident he can remember is this garbage can bullshit, and even he gets it wrong constantly. So when you can't tell your own story correctly, any time, that's when you know it's ninety nine percent ninety nine point cent horseshit. Uh, ben, with, with the quote. Fell down on top of my head almost. Almost. Um, and but you know, Mr. Chestnut uh, I, now is in the picture. So Mr. Chestnut was there. So he was yeah, right, somehow right. there to witness this. Right. Look so at Mr. Ch it, this Chestnut's was now in a gym class, you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Look at his lightning fast responses. He's asked a question without hesitation. No, that didn't happen. You know, right. 60 40. I, like I said, Body language experts should study Howard. What does he do whenever uh, he wants to control the situation? He physically gets up and walks closer to the camera so he fills more of the frame than the others so he can take over. You know, yep. listen to my story, not those guys in the background. Oh, yeah. And he does this for the roasts. <clears throat> you will notice in the roast we had, um, we did, well, who, who was Channel it for? Nine. The Channel 9 roast. Howard is constantly getting up, constantly hogging yeah. attention yeah. constantly being in the frame interrupting taking, people interrupting people when he knows it's going bad or he thinks it's going bad he's not letting people do anything he doesn't he doesn't want people to speak or doesn't want people mm -hmm. to say certain things he hogs the camera he stands up he commands attention in odd yeah. ways like this Vir virtually and, every talk show appearance as well and even yes, once he's not Arsenio. involved in, when we covered the, when we covered the, the better half, if you look in the better half, uh, he calls in when he wants it to go in a certain direction because John Hines not taking it where he wants it to go. So he calls in, takes over for 15 minutes and they allow him to do it. Now, uh, someone who's really in control of their audience, their microphone, their narrative, what they want to present, the questions they like to direct towards him, uh, like a, a Phil Donahue, who you'd think, like as an old pro, should know better. But he allows Howard that leeway because I think maybe it's because it's a one-time only deal. He allowed but, Howard um, to chase him around the studio to try to kiss yes, him. Yes, yeah. And so you'd think some of these people, because I guess they just don't know him well enough or they haven't studied him like we do. But my God, if I had, if I had him st strapped to a chair with his arms, not, unable to do the Jesus pose, no glasses, uh, <laughs> you know, un unlimited footage, like a CCTV camera type st shooting style and fill him with the full of truth serum, I guarantee it would break YouTube records. It would, oh, it, if we filled him with truth serum, none of us would be prepared for the answers. No, we would be shocked. Yeah. And I say this as people who obviously, you know, we know what we're talking about. We would be shocked to hear the real truth. Even presuming what we think we know. Yeah. Um, presume the worst and you will still be shocked. I mean, I remember, <laughs> I, I remember from, the, I don't even know what sketches was, but when I was a kid. I remember a Saturday Night Live sketch where a guy dies and he asks an angel. Okay. So like, what's the most shocking thing that you could tell me? And he goes, oh, I couldn't even tell you. You're not ready. And it was basically like, all right, what's the one millionth most? Because you're not ready yet to be, that's where we are. We're not ready yeah. for truth serum from Howard Stern. But yeah, I also yeah. want to just quickly say, going back to um, him monopolizing and controlling the narrative, there's no better 
better example of that than the 60 Minutes profile where he asks Ed asks Beth a question and Howard says, oh, this is such a great story. We And then he goes, wait a minute, let her tell it, Howard. And Beth goes, no, I like it. I like that he does, <laughs> that he takes over. <laughs> Don't ruin my night, Ed. <laughs> yeah. Don't ruin my narrative. It It's also when um, Robin was on Sally, that's kind of an indication of how it goes when you don't have control. So Robin went on Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and this is what happens when you don't have Howard and you do play along and you're not in control. You get somewhat of the truth. And Robin was trying to control things, but it doesn't go your way. That was so <laughs> hilarious beyond belief. You get some truth spit back in your face and you get also you get your real colors. I mean, there were so many turnarounds. Robin was such a two faced piece of shit in that episode. It was unbelievable. She said so many things out the side of her mouth. It was unbelievable. Yeah, she. Yeah, it was it was it was it was, it was, it was an exercise. Asinine. In, it was exercise in strapping a. Uh, uh, leather, putting leather straps on a rat and watching it try to wriggle itself free. Uh, did you ever watch <laughs> you that know, episode? I was going to say, I just want to, I want to say, I'd never had heard of even that episode until I heard it through your podcast. You guys did a great job on that. It was clear that you guys knew what you're talking about. And, uh, I really enjoyed listening to that. <laughs> the whole unexpurgated thing is on there and I, I, tr I truncated it so it just included the Robin stuff because there's a good 15 minutes of extra crap but uh, I found it funny especially that she didn't also warrant her own standalone episode with Sa with Sally and I know that had to bother her <laughs> that she was shoehorned into that segment and Wait, what I was it like my race hates me was no no it was it was the it was they say I hate my own race oh, which he turned into which the following day, the rebuttal online uh, on on Howard was, of course, they hate, I hate my own race, which was a complete bullshit. Like that's not what it said, and it's they say there's the save, but and it's true they say because everybody says it about her. That is the truth, and they decided well she's not in she's not um, appealing enough. We have to add these extra ringers who also hate who we think hate, well, who are documented. They, they admit, we don't like being Puerto Rican. We don't like being this and that. And then that had to gall her even more because she didn't warrant her own episode. But this was what, would if Howard were to be on a panel that actually had the, had the tenacity to put him on the same way that show put Robin on, that would be amazing. I would love it. I mean, I would love it. He would uh, curl up into a ball, you know, metaphorically. Fetal position. He would, he would, he would just say, I'm not, he would leave. He would just storm off. There's no, I can't imagine a situation in which he would allow himself to be interrogated um, in an aggressive way. Yeah, uh, like, that, like that audience was. And I can't imagine outside of podcasters hater hate listeners who would be who would be in the position to do that because yeah. everyone who interviews him will tell you he's evolved he's a feminist yeah. he's right. um uh mature now he was out of his mind and he recovered through therapy and so on they all fall for it right so um so well you, see, so see you this will never happen you say fall for it i say they are continuing propaganda i well, don't yeah, think they fall right. for it i mean that's a it's lazy it's too. it's lazy journalism at its heart i mean they no, really it's, don't it's purpose for it's purposeful um tall tale telling and continuing the line that he's selling they're saying it on purpose they don't believe it at the closest, for a fucking second right the closest the closest it. they know the closest, him the closest hiding he's had is from maureen callahan who he still went after and she oh, nailed that. him so perfectly in that last, uh, write up she did for the, um, was it the post New York post? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, uh, we had to make a whole episode about her, her history of writing about him and his rebuttal the one time. And since he's not been able to come back at her because she's too smart for him. And people don't realize, or maybe they do in the early nineties, that would be unheard of. For someone to be going after Howard like this, 
Oh, I yes. Mean, he's, he threatened people on the air. Um, I think in Miss America, he brags about threatening a judge on the air mm-hmm. that uh, basically cease and desist or pay the price. Um, you know, he used that platform as a threatening. I mean, I worked with a guy who um, was a journalist who was in Buff. I think he was in Buff- Syracuse, or Buffalo, or Syracuse, somewhere, somewhere in New York, uh, in New York. Yeah, and um, after um, DeBella's wife was found dead of suicide, he wrote uh, an article for that publication saying Howard Stern is to blame. Um, he exploited this woman and so mm-hmm. on and so on. And so, uh, at the time I was a big Howard Stern fan. I mean, I, I like this guy, but, um, he, he's, he was 20 years older than me, tw- is 20 years older than me or so. And, you know, was wiser than me at the time. So he said, uh, he actually wrote about it for the publication that I worked for at the time that, um, Gary had reached out to him and said, Howard would like to talk to you to come on the air and discuss this piece that you've written. And, uh, so Howard discussed it on the air, but he said, there is no way I'm going on the air to be outnumbered and pummeled by everyone on, on that staff. Cause he knows how the show works. Exactly. But, um, but that's just a personal story I have of how journalists knew, look, you are in a lot of ways taking your life in your hands. I mean, you've seen just recently the, the, the woman on the weather, the weather woman or whatever, on some South Carolina, yeah. I believe it was Kentucky station who mm. heard that Howard Stern gave us, you know, a, a, a body speech at Jennifer Aniston's wedding and merely said, what is Howard Stern doing at Jennifer Aniston's wedding? And yep. that sent Howard into let's Tailspin. read her bio. Let's read her LinkedIn on the air. Let's comment on her looks. Let's say she probably had her brains fucked out to even say such a thing, which is yep. what his go-to thing is. This woman oh, yeah. must have had her brains fucked out to talk about this. Right. So, um, Maureen Callahan has ha, proves. I mean, you know, you guys prove he hasn't have juice anymore. You guys couldn't have done a podcast about Howard Stern and not have Howard. Stern. You're not bombarded with people who go, "How dare you talk about Howard Stern?" You guys are dead. None of that. No, I've no. seen your you YouTube right comments. That. Like, great job. Old old people in the in the radio game. I have um, friends who were um, parents who were old broadcasters who have said you're doing this and we're literally afraid for me like you're doing a podcast know, about howard stern well i mean um the uh, my running joke I'm is like no please you could just you, shit? you could just imagine the uh the uh lawyer look saying at this i'd like look at this I'd like to call this loser in the hamptons <laughs> i'd like to call mr fingers to the sand <laughs> so <laughs> it's not going to work too well. Uh, let's continue, guys. Let's try to get as far as we can. The next clip is called uh, Suffer the Little Puppets, and this is still from Chapter 1. Revealing youthful creativity and mischievous instincts. Instead of making ordinary crank phone calls, Howard pretended to be TV game show host Gene Rayburn and used a tape recorder to capture the reaction of the unsuspecting people he dialed. I would put the microphone on the phone and give away prizes, he told a reporter. I do insane stuff like that and then tape it and make it part of the shows I do when I was a little kid. In these make-believe radio shows, Howard also presented daffy moments with marionettes and dummies. Howard would maintain a lifelong interest in puppets at home and on his radio show. Yeah, called the staff. Them, he was able to act out and to express darker imaginings. His parents were unaware that little Howie, as many of his friends called him, was treating his pals to simulated sex shows with the puppets. The Stern's basement became a performance space for Howard and his puppets. Now we're going to play back, uh, hold on, uh, we're going to play back the audio of the uh, sex, sex puppets debunked, and then we'll, can, oh, we'll table that. I don't think I ever saw an X-rated puppet show, but it's extremely possible that it did happen at some point. You know, our hormones were starting to kick in, and one of the few outlets we had were the uh, the puppets. I never saw an X-ray. Was, I think that's an exaggeration. I mean, maybe later he did stuff like that, or when he was alone. But that was not stuff that we saw a lot of in elementary and junior high. And okay, we're just going to continue. That's almost done. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was you know little when you, you know have in the bottle at parties and stuff like that but you know it never it was a much more innocent time 
and there just wasn't a lot of that stuff that happened. I never saw it. I don't think he would show with that to his sister. <laughs> <laughs> so I never saw that. I see a comment. Okay, so you've had three people that, that were questioned about it and all said, I never saw it, I don't think it happened. So I read this in the book, and in my notes I wrote poignant, and I said this paragraph uh, is a perfect metaphor and microcosm of Howard's life. I think uh, the, the, the psychologists all zero in on that too and go, oh, you like to manipulate, you like to be the one in control, you like to be the one who pulls the strings and so on. Uh, so far, Ben and Ray has indulged every hobby uh, his son has ever wanted. Yep. Yeah. Ray, yep. he goes, you're into puppets. I'll build you a stage for your puppets. I'll go to England and buy you the the best that they have. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's just incredible that the prison and hell and torturous life he has is so far uh, shaping up to be not so much. So this brings us to number five. Ben is responsible for unleashing the Kraken. Ben. A radio engineer equipped the area with a reel-to-reel -reel tape player, microphones, and turntables that enabled Howard to cue up records like a disc jockey. Howard created an environment much like the glassed-in studios where he would release his manic energy into the airwaves. It was in the basement, too, that Howard's rock and roll group, Electric Comic Book, sometimes practiced. The band featured Jerry Dickowitz on drums and Robert Carger on guitar. Howard sang lead on original tunes such as Silver Nickels and Golden Dimes and Psychedelic B. Howard also played an electric keyboard unlike any on the market. His father had wired the keyboard to an amplifier. The people who attended Dickowitz's bar mitzvah heard that would be Electric Comic Book's only public performance. It was an event that assumed such fatuous importance in Howard's mind that in 1994, he likened the comic book's musical reunion on the radio to a reformation of Cream, the British super trio famous during Howard's Roosevelt days. <laughs> okay, please, guys, <laughs> have at it. There was a period in his life where Howard seemed to like music, although I think he liked more being uh, the center of attention. That's and, right. And, you know, being the rock star. Yeah. Then he actually liked music. I said, this is just like more supported hobbies by Ben and Ray continued. An influential parent wouldn't be a man who doesn't pay attention to his kids. Like, these are more yeah. hobbies. So we got puppets. We got bands. I mean, what the fuck? How many hobbies yeah. do you want paid for? When you hear that Ben Stern said, oh, you want to play the keyboard, but you want to do it rock and roll style. I'll wire it to an amp. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, that that's um. I mean, obviously it's caring and so on. Also, if you've heard psychedelic B and you've heard uh, oh, so, uh, so, 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 those, uh, drum solos that blast your ears out, that's a supportive father who says, "I'll put up with that." You know, it makes yeah. my son happy. Go down there right. and, and, and play that drum solo over and over and over again. There's, you cannot find a set of parents anywhere in the world who would willingly submit, submit to their child's desire to be a drummer because <laughs> you need the space and you need the you need the earplugs because it's just yeah. a big pain in the ass. It's not like picking up the violin or flute or fucking oboe or a sousaphone or anything where you can actually tune that out and just give them a little space. Drums are such a big pain in the ass. And so he... But Ben... And we're going to get, play the clips, guys. They Most everybody defends Ben as being a very present, yes. loving. Uh, yes. when, and when he wasn't working, he was doing whatever he could for his kids. And Ellen will be the one of the first people to say it. His sister, who, you know, doesn't exist in so many forms of media. Sam. So listen, I'm going to read this line again, just because I think it's so important. For all of the youthful hijinks that Howard engaged in outside his parents' line of sight, Ben Stern unwittingly did much more then simply equipped his son for diversions in rock, music, and puppetry. He did so much. People have to understand at that time, there's no, most kids did not have a fraction of what he had. Come to my house? Yeah. Ele right. Electronic stuff especially, I mean, was expensive. To make that stuff was, it was tough. It, and then to buy it was certainly almost out of the question, unless you were really well-to-do parents and stuff. And here's a tape recorder. Record yourself. I mean, that's yeah. expensive. Right. That's massively yeah. expensive. Nobody had that. I mean, they all, we had a yeah, Sears recorder that, that wouldn't die. But... <laughs> yeah. All of the youthful hijinks that Howard engaged in outside his parents' line of sight 
Ben Stern unwittingly did much more than simply equip his son for diversions in rock music and puppetry. In his own professional life, Ben went a long way to influence his son's choice of a career and on-air persona. When Howard was a youngster, Ben was a co-owner of Aura Recording, Inc. on West 52nd Street in Manhattan. Aura did a steady business in the taping of advertising agencies' commercials, which included the voices of top disc jockeys, such as Dan Ingram and Ted Brown. Aura also laid down the audio tracks for television cartoons. Don Adams, a comedian who entertained in nightclubs and frequently appeared on Ed Sullivan's television show, was the unadvertised voice of the sarcastic penguin Tennessee Tuxedo, a Saturday morning children's fixture on CBS from 1963 to 1966. Starting in 1965, Adams starred as agent Maxwell Smart in the TV sitcom Get Smart. Beyond that, guys, the book me mentions that Wally Cox did the recording for Underdog, uh, and, and Wally Cox was a childhood, like a not childhood, but a one the best friend of Marlon Brando at the time, and I think probably butt buddies too, based on other things I've read. But either way, uh, they had a very odd relationship, um, and so it, Ben Stern was you know, clearly respected as a guy who knew how to get stuff done because Tennessee Tuxedo, Don Adams, uh, all these recording jingles and vignettes, whatever, in his studio is clearly a capable guy, capable, capable guy and obviously made a good living because studios, studios were never cheap. And in that era, uh, even rarer to find. And now it's, it's the, you know, the days of Pro Tools were, you know, decades mm -hmm. away, guys. But he also likes this fact that his father is an absolute savant in this profession, but he also likes this narrative as my dad was never there and paid attention to me. You can't have it both ways. You yeah. can't have the fact that you like your dad was this professional who was a success in his career and enjoy that and think of this as an amazing triumph, but then also slam it and say he was a terrible father that was never there that called you a moron. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. fair. It's not right. You can have both things and you can carry both thoughts in your head, you fucking asshole. It's just not well, right. I, I I believe that um the father hunger and the absentee father are all inventions of therapy. That um, you know, I if you Google father hunger, homosexuality, you'll find the link. So they, they show up in the same articles often. I believe that the, because, you know, Ben Stern was not used to be, did, used to be cast as a guy who, uh, you know, was, was um, Stern, yeah. but not as a guy who was never there. Howard right. is the guy who was never there. So I believe that Howard has cast Ben Stern as a worse father than Howard Stern yeah. Because it helps him deal with his own inadequacies as a father. I mean, 100%. when you think of Howard Stern, you don't think of Howard Stern parent to three th children. You think of him as Howard Stern son to Ben and Ray. He's perpetually the son, perpetually the the boy who's overlooked and so on. But he right. is the man overlooking the children. So, right. uh, so through therapy, he's reinvented who Ben Stern was and said, I didn't learn how to be a father because I had no father. Right. Um, so he's forgiving himself. Yeah, of course. It It's not true also because Ben, even though he had this amazing career that Howard admired and respected, which he talks about throughout his career and on the radio multiple times. And he also talks about uh, him as a father in a loving way as well on the radio, which he can't deny, and we have clips of, he he negates the fact that Ben would sit at the table and even though he was busy with his work, he would sit there and he would talk to him, open the paper up, talk to him about topics of the day, mm -hmm. uh, inform him on what's going on in the world. He would talk to him about anything. He would just talk to him. He would sit in the car and talk to him. He would bring him into his studio. He would take him to plays. He would take him to the studio. Yeah, he would the take him to the work. Musical, he would want to, he would want to, in, he would want to include him into baseball games or include him into any sort of, and like 
He would want to give him music equipment. He would want to give him things. He would want to be a father. Mm -hmm. He was the father you would want. Howard's the absentee Definitely. father. In in history of Howard Stern, he says that how. By the way, Howard always says, "Oh, uh, I got into radio because um, you know, my father. I wanted to impress." Why isn't he saying, "I want to become a jingle singer"? Uh, you know, I want to become. <laughs> Right. That's exactly that's exactly what I was going to bring up because you used you made that point before that uh, you know if you're if you're really admiring your father's employ uh, or is his the or the the work that he does uh, making other people better than they can be why wouldn't you become a radio engineer why wouldn't you become a voice actor like Billy West and maybe right. that it's in, inherently when we covered we recently covered the John Cape versus Billy West uh, saga the. Uh, the appearance and it was a three-parter i think it's you'd absolutely enjoy that one uh, as well ben so um check that out he he, he the, we we feel we we feel that ben stern admired billy west which may have given howard all kinds of agita anyway the same way he loved seinfeld and wig was constantly yeah. down on seinfeld and by the way everybody not after the show became a success but seinfeld was still going on the show as, as late as season four of seinfeld so that narrative is also bullshit but that i digress uh so i believe a lot of it was fuck him like i was not the sole sun i was not the sole moon orbiting the planet of ben you know so fuck everybody else <laughs> fuck saturn fuck pluto well, you know yeah <laughs> You, you know, you know um, Howard is the result of a miscarriage. Ray had had a miscarriage. No, yeah, I, I mean, not, yeah. not, not in a joking way. Ray yeah. had a miscarriage. And no, I was thinking, just like they, Allison, they, you know, they wish it had been reversed. And Howard has contempt for the baby that was not born. I mean, yes. he, he talks about the jealousy he has of yeah. the thought of having a sibling. Now, there sure. wouldn't be a Howard if there had been that baby. They were going to stop it, too. Another interesting part. So Howard said in um, the Rolling Stone February uh, 94 article, he said, uh, the journalist said, fear drives Howard Stern, not hate or megalomania. And Howard said, I'm still scared of the image of the old time announcer showing up at a bar mitzvah and handing out pictures and balloons. He says, I've tried to elevate the role of disc jockey to somewhere beyond circus clown and carnival barker. He just turned 40 because there's a chip on his shoulder the size of Long Island. All his newfound fame cash fandom still don't satisfy him. I ask if having his own late night show would to me that would be the ultimate credibility he replies would i love to take letterman's audience away from him and just shut his trap yeah i would i would love to do that do i think that i can i know i can <laughs> so it wasn't about being a radio guy or that's what he, it it the no. narrative always changes so oh you wanted to so now it's about you wanted to be a tv guy now yeah radio was a stepping stone that he made it very clear early on in the, in the NBC days. I'm only going to be in radio for this much longer. And then I'm out. I'm going to either get into movies. I'm going to get into TV, something, but I'm not going to be in radio for very long. I mean, he, when he got out of college, he wrote a letter to Jim Henson because he wanted to be a Muppeteer. I mean, he loved <laughs> puppets. That's not, that's not, that's true. That's true. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Kirk, so Kermit wanted saw, to control Kermit. Yeah. So he saw himself as, this is a face for the silver screen. You know, I'll work Muppets and then eventually I'll be, you know, whatever. But he saw himself as this is a bigger deal. I mean, than yeah. radio. This can't yeah. be contained. He's now since rewritten it because he failed and said right. it was always radio. The plan right. was always radio. Right. Yes. So the next clip is called Shut Up, Sit Down, Original Edit. Shut up, <laughs> sit down. What a day in the face. It's <laughs> oh, my dad yelling at me. That was my dad yelling at me, though. That was I know, me. I could hear you in the background. <laughs> Shut up! Sit down. <laughs> I don't know. I never talked to my kids like that. You never talked to them, period. So how could you talk to them like that? Okay, let's continue. If I say shut up to my kids, my kids lay a guilt trip on me for 15 minutes, how it's not nice to say shut up and to start crying, and I, and I get crazy. I go, yeah, why am I don't say that to anybody. Why should I yell at them shut up? So in addition to being afraid of baseballs, uh, in addition to being afraid of women, uh, in addition to being afraid of being seen as bald, uh, he's afraid of his children. So that's a, that's a father of the well, year. Well, I, I would say that Howard's reaction as a kid and his reaction to an adult and hearing that suggests Ben and Howard had a fine relationship. He wasn't 
frightened to death when he heard his dad say, shut up, sit down. No. He just probably pouted some more and did whatever. And also, it, the reason why Howard would say, oh, I would have a guilt trip or whatever, he didn't have that kind of relationship with his daughters. They were no. foreign to him. They're foreign. In the interview in 94, would you give up your radio show? I can. I'm under contract for two years. I would have to do both. I would have no personal life. If you're getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're doing a show from 6 to 11, 6 to 11, guys, 6 to 11 a.m., how much more free time do you have? If you got a wife and kids, I hardly see my kids as it is. So I suppose money will have to pers- uh, be persuasive in terms of doing late-night television. So basically you have to pay me to see my kids. I yeah, hardly yeah. see them as it is. <laughs> and then when he, when he talks about making that door in his office where he had the dog door and oh, uh, he could be completely isolated, you might just imagine it like some kind of panic room, uh, free from children, free from nuclear warheads going off, uh, m- murderers, rapists, muggers, uh, and obviously his wife. And uh, it makes more sense that when you hear that, when you read the uh, Emily Stern article, <laughs> that door is symbolically the door between the real world and Neverland. And, you know, yep. basements are such <laughs> an important part of his life. I mean, the that's Peter where the Pan's Lost Boys hang out. That's where Peter the Peter Pansexual, you called him. Yeah, the Peter Pansexual. <laughs> that's where he comes out to play. And yeah. that door is to remain locked by, by a wire, remember, you know. Peter, and, and, remember, remember, Peter, yeah. remember. Yeah, I mean. Come on, he, Peter. In that basement, he's not it. a father. He's, he's with Jerry Dickowitz and then with Alan, and they're playing... Quote, chess. I'm a kid. I was getting mixed messages from my parents. It was like, isn't this exciting? Don't get excited. <laughs> you know, it was just like. <laughs> <laughs> but my old man, really, that that's how my old man thought of me. You know, now my old man. He, he hated you. He hated you because you were an impossible fucking child. I just don't think there was a lot of patience back in the day. Like, the patience None. that Ben had for this was unbelievable and they even rewarded this fucking shit that's exactly yeah. right like he did not get punishment he didn't get appropriate punishment that's the problem. i mean i i can remember i mean the phone back then was a big deal in my house like my dad was always on the phone for work and i remember one time my friend picked up the phone when my dad was on the work call and he goes get off the fucking phone and my friend was like <laughs> scarred for life and he like i remember had to go over and he like apologized to my neighborhood friend and we joke about it still to this day but it was so funny but parents back then we had very little patience for bullshit like you just yeah. knew what to do yeah you did what you were told you and weren't you were in a you know- shit no. but also could consider the the situation here they are in the in the recording studio Record the tape is expensive. The time, time is, short. is expensive. Yeah, they're about to record Ellen sing with music accompaniment, and then Howard. But I want to do that. I mean, just as he's getting ready to do, you know, conduct, <laughs> just as he's getting ready, you know, he's got he's like ready to go, and then Howard does that. I mean, it's comedy, and then but also remember too, Howard and Ben together watched Three Stooges and yeah. looked at Mad Magazine. Words like moron and stupid. Uh, were just part of the vernacular. It wasn't yeah. as though you should be a moron. Excuse me. You know, you're right. not going to be offended that, that, that the word that you hear constantly as entertainment <laughs> would be used. It, it, that's the exact, exactly. That's why when he said the Jap comment, that was oh, yeah. probably something that was tossed right. around in the household, yep. except for, whoops, you're not supposed to say that on a recording. Right. 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 Yep. Loves me. Now stop it. He loved you even then. He loved me, but he really thought I was a bum. Let's get <laughs> off his case. Every parent acted like my that. dad. My dad was pretty. Uh, my dad's pretty honest with me. He's, he even tell you that he thought I was pretty stupid. <laughs> well, that's well, different. <laughs> Just the other day when I was looking at this, I highlighted this in our I wrote, "What?" Here's because Colford writes, "So much time and energy was being." expended in remedial instruction that the more advanced <laughs> youngsters such as Howard lack the challenge. Howard was never advanced. And Ray and, the, and Ben will tell you that. That yeah. he was not, even the history of Howard Stern, she goes, well, he was very average. Is what yeah. she is. I mean, that's that's a compliment. Yeah. 
he was a certified dumbass, and so was Robin. Ironically, she was in the slow yeah. class when she yeah. in your she writes about it in her book. You know, the the teacher she had a she had a bone to pick with me because of my cousin who was older, and this, so that's what every everybody you know everybody's the the victim. They say in the November Time uh, magazine article in '93, Stern graduated with good grades from the prestigious Boston University. <laughs> <laughs> and has assembled an unbroken onward and upward resume and better and better radio jobs ever since. Now, I never saw his grades from Boston University, so I'm not sure where. Well, you know, uh, two of those years were basic studies. Basic studies. And so he had that's tutors. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and that's then he, like, watched, and he was like watching Ingrid Bergmar, Bergman movies. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Right. He yeah, had t- so. But he had t- he had tutors in elementary school, like that he, that he yeah. admitted on on occasions. So like you know, oh, I got a you know an A plus on my math score, and then someone said, yeah, but my friend Alan said, yeah, but you had a tutor. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is the it's sign. A microcosm. I mean, every every sign points to these were parents who were very caring about their kids. Yeah. Like you, you afforded you you put the money towards extra extra tutors for your kid to get to the level of other kids. That's yeah. I mean, that, that was unheard of. And when I was growing up, I never heard of a tutor until I was well into my teens. Uh, and I go like, I mean, I knew the concept, but I never knew of anybody having a tutor for anything aside from later on piano, you know, music, whatever. That was fine. But for remedial studies, never. never. I need a tutor now for Common Core math. <laughs> yeah. Well, Howard continues. And by the way, I meant to say Ingrid, Ingmar Bergman is meant the name I yeah. meant to say. But um, so Howard has tutors for his hobbies. So uh, I would like to know more about calligraphy, please. Okay. I would like to know more about journaling. I would like to know more about um, beer can chicken cooking. I would like to know whatever it might be. So, you know, most of us go, all right, uh, I like something. I'm going to start, you know, I'll, I'll buy magazines about it. I'll, I'll look at YouTube videos on it or whatever. Right. He needs to be told how to enjoy his hobbies. Yeah. He was so ingenious. He was so ingenious. He even bestowed the status of uh, the uh, creator of uh, conversion therapy on Dr. Sarno, who didn't know he was capable of it. Uh, you know, <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you need a day. If you ever do a Ta-da! Dr. Sarno chapter, just on Dr. Sarno, I, I'll count me in on that one. Okay, well, we'll just we'll add it to the mountain of projects. Yeah, and then my oh mother. My yeah, and then my mother. You know what it is? My mom didn't think anything was so wrong with what I was doing, but she sees my dad getting upset, so she has to like, she has to rub it in. Oh, Bullshit. Dear. What's what wrong, wrong with you? Saying? What What's wrong with you? You retard. Oh, can't you be quiet? They don't. They don't get it. What's wrong with? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm being a kid. How old were you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? They, they, she knew, she knew, and he was just unbelievable. And, and like I said, Ellen's going to come in, and she's going to defend Ben. How old were yeah. you when this was going on? I was nineteen, Robin. Oh, oh. Okay, you know, this well, there is, was should be like an adult. Like <laughs> now, how old were you? My old man sounds like me at a writing session yelling at Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down and shut up. <laughs> Go ahead. We're going to play that same song. Shut up! Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be in the opening of the show. Yeah, we got to get. Well, we we can work that in. I <laughs> you can just see this kid like on, like on on Ritalin or something. You know, oh, he's needing so to be annoying. Yeah, but you know what's, what's frustrating though is that even as an adult, he's incapable of recognizing that he was misbehaving. Yes. That 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 he was being annoying. That yeah. He was like pulling at someone's nerves. He yeah. only is capable of seeing himself as the victim, the and victim. he sets the stage so that Robin falls right in line. You know, yeah, you were the victim, you were the victim, that kind of thing. Yeah. And also, he doesn't answer the question. She's asking, how old were you? Yeah. In other words, old enough to know better is this right. the real, resp- the proper response. Sam? There is no introspection no. where when you look back on your life, there are times where even as a parent, I look back and I... I really want to apologize to my mom, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, I am so sorry, and yeah, I you, hope to God my child in, does not. Yeah, fall if you're any kind of thinking, of if you're any kind of, years. if you're any yeah. kind of thinking human being, forward thinking human being, and you can look back and and realize the mistakes you made, because you know what's the expression: take forty years of mistakes and call them wisdom. Um, you you should be able to uh, actively say, look, I was a shit. Or, you know, I'm really sorry I did that. I, I, that always, you know, struck me as, as bad. 
And then, I mean, in, in, unless you're, you're in the unfortunate position of having shitty parents, which, you know, happens too. But the, you don't get the sense of that from Ben and Ray. Although Bob D, when we get into the psychological aspect, he does have a bone to pick with Ray on a certain level. But I don't think at this stage of, of his life, because it's, you know, much later on, the whole, I lost my sister, I was depressed, blah, blah, blah. He wants to make it like he was eight years old when that happens. But he was like 18 or 19 when that yes, happened. Yes, he was. And it's not, it's not something that should affect someone at that age who's a fully you know still growing yes but old enough to know that's your mother's tragedy not yours were there stuff that like parenting goes the other way where it's like sometimes parents do stuff wrong when like say you my parents would always like scream at us for spilling things as an accident and it's like a total <laughs> accident yeah. Why are you yelling at us for spilling things as an accident? That's not a big deal. And I don't do that because it's well, an accident. Yeah. So those yeah. so those things you learn from that and you don't do that. But this case, Ben should call Howard a moron. I right. completely agree with this. God, he was, he was well, being kind. You know, just, just to give you a little bit more context there. So when when Howard starts playing the clips that day, he'd never he hadn't heard these things. He hears this little kid's voice, and he goes, who is that? And then Robin and the others go, that's you. So he goes from the out-of-body experience of not even knowing who that is when he hears it <laughs> to immediately being offended when that person gets told to shut up, immediately yep. being hurt. I mean, yep. that's not you. That's so far from you at this point. You should be able to objectively look at that and go, oh, my God, I was really annoying. Yeah. Uh, oh my. And you should be able to go, you know what? My dad in this clip is younger than I am right now. So yeah, he's going to make a mistake and say, shut up when he's frustrated. Right. That he re regrets doing, obviously, unfortunately right. it's recorded. And, but you know, here's the funny thing is that this was pre therapy, Howard. Yep. 20 plus years of therapy later, he is even more upset at his father for telling him to shut up at that moment. Yep. It's, Rather than grow from it and go, can you imagine being put in a situation where you're so yeah. stressed out, you say something you regret? Right. A, no. a, a, from a dad who complained on the air about his ch children running up the phone bill, that was his yeah. big complaint, that they were costing him money, making long-distance calls by accident or something like that. And that's his, that's his comparative – that's his analysis. Oh, I mean, look at Miss America and you realize who Howard is. I mean, it's a – Dark book. Dark. And one of the things that he says in that is he comes home and Allison asks him, can you watch the baby so While I can take a shower. a shower? Yeah. And he loses it and says, the agreement was, this is yours, not mine. And uh, <laughs> I mean, you know what? If Ben Stern had said something like that, I would go, whoa. Yeah. But Howard is the one who said stuff like this and printed it and, and approved it. And yep. he, proud not, his name on and, it. and sold it. Not yep. only did he print that, he said it on air. I got a bunch of stuff now because Scott's going through it. Shut up, sit down. Yeah. That's the <laughs> that's what we want everybody to do. Ready, Ellen? Go ahead. We're gonna play that same song. So minute, Shut up, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with you? My mother. She has to chime in. It's not bad enough. My old man just made me feel like a dog <laughs> in front of everyone, in front of my cousins and every. Fuck off. Sorry, that pisses me off, especially because my old man's now in the same state as uh, Ben Stern. He's not, he does, he might, some days he might not even remember know who I am. And uh, I'd love to have, you know, that time with, the, the time he had with Ben where Ben was still lucid and he was able to. That just gets me fucking upset. Sorry, guys. Yeah, the whole family was yeah. there. Shut up! Shut up! I mean, I can understand now as an adult, my old man was been totally furious just having to do this for the day. But, you know, they do say that he wasn't upset having to do it. He was upset having to fucking police his little maniac shithead asshole child. That's what he was upset with. He wanted to take you guys down. It was a day in the fucking studio. It was basically a day at the beach without a beach. He didn't have to do it. He wanted to no, do it. Exactly. And he wanted this, you know, because how many of us grew up with Super 8 or any kind of thing? I didn't, not until I was much, like, my, my, my brother and sister didn't. It wasn't until way later, and they had, like, more pictures of, you know, me than they have of them, because obviously as the years progressed, it was more commonplace. But they would have loved to have had more, you know, video footage and, and stuff like that that was very special and unique at the time. Sam? 
And like you said, Fillmore, wouldn't you love more time to trash him, your father, or what? <laughs> you wouldn't like more time to make him seem like a maniac, right. horrible person, well, or... That's why when we found out that he said they left the house to Ellen, uh, I, I was laughing hysterically for five minutes because he was bitching about it and saying, and, and then going to Anderson Cooper saying, isn't that unfair, you know, when the parents just, you know, give, leave their house to, you know, uh, one sibling and they shouldn't, they don't even it out. Like <laughs> you make multimillionaire and your sister's, you know, anyway. I thought it was even more weird how when uh, John Stamos was talking about he was getting verklempt talking about yeah. his dad's the, letter, the, his dad's letter. Yeah. And he was hoping to connect with Fa Howard on that level. And Howard, just nothing, just <laughs> absolutely nothing. It was like talking to a cardboard box. Like, huh? Who? You'd get, you'd get more human interaction. Anyone from the home? Box. Yeah. Anyone? Okay. No one? No, uh, no one there. Anybody? <laughs> In public. That's the worst thing you can My do. My parents did that on a daily basis. <laughs> on a daily basis. Why do you think I'm such a bitter man? Oh, man. I didn't realize. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, this is this is tip of the iceberg stuff. I wish I had more evidence. That's evidence. Uh, you know, you can go to any psychologist <laughs> today and they will tell your parents. <laughs> they were wrong. They destroyed you. They did, though. At that though. moment, they destroyed you. Okay, fucking uh. pricks. Now, this is where the next clip was supposed to go in where we played the, you know, the we don't want the Japs anymore. But since we've already played it, I'll yeah. just go ahead yeah. and go on to the next one. The, but first, this is, Sam. The, this is interesting. So see how Robin just said this is you could go to any psychologist and they would say this is evidence. But the point is saying this this isn't something that should be something a psychologist should bring about. This no. isn't something that was fucking no. with Howard's head. He no. wasn't even aware that this even was something. He didn't even realize this was him in a video. You're, Just like you're that laying, set. you're laying by that by doing it, you're laying the groundwork for creating victimization where there is none, and in actually you're giving them a, like a get out of jail card where where it comes to you know putting blame where it should not be, and um, in fact, um, you know the uh, the uh, Robin's the worst to talk about it because we don't believe anything in her most of the things in her book we don't believe where it comes to the molestation and i know mm -hmm. i'm going to get in trouble for it but i don't give a fuck we read the book we covered it we know yeah. mm -hmm. based we on her it. and the audio we don't believe the molestation because of the way she acts and it doesn't fit the narrative of someone who's actually been through that and you talk anecdotally empirically look up uh victims uh, read read all the literature look at the documentaries on youtube netflix wherever you like none of them would laugh about what she claims no. she has gone through so and, that's and where it, you guys yeah. complaining about us and bitching that you should just blatantly believe someone who claims they were abused you should all fuck off and do your homework yeah. just listen to howard his reaction if he has a guest who says and you were you were molested as a kid he acts like it's sacred it's the most um you, you there's no laughing matter about this there's no, i mean for if he truly believes robin was molested then he is the worst villain in the world because yes. he mocks her for it yep. and they laugh about it all oh, like oh your father would love to see you like this or your father Song would love parodies hand yeah. hands yeah. bill yeah right so uh don't and be mad at you at us for not believing it because of what we read and the fact that she unearthed these memories in um you know in the environment where that was the whole point was to um put down men um and trauma from your families the, the, your family members so how the whole thing was so Howard was it was tra so traumatized by this childhood that he didn't even remember he was the person in these clips. No. He didn't even remember. And then Robin said somebody would be so traumatized if they went to a psychologist about these clips. And then this gets laid down as the foundation for this whole narrative. Yep. So this is bullshit. Yep. Right, yeah. she knows. She's she's defending her meal ticket. And uh, this next one's called Ben Nixon. Howard's very close to my parents. I don't care what he says. I mean, my father was so ridiculous. I, I don't, and I'm shocked that he did say that. I don't know. But Howard was the type of kid who could drive you nuts. <laughs> and here's what happens. On the holidays, at that time I didn't own the studio. I just worked there. So on the weekends I was off, and I would take the family in for the annual recording. You know, it was him, his sister, you know, and some relatives and stuff. And, you know, I would 
get behind the, the control there. And we'll be, okay, guys, just a little break. We called these kids. Yeah, when, the, can I say hey, something yeah. really quick? That yeah. uh, that Ellen was an eyewitness to it and four years yes. older than Howard at the time. And right. she is shocked that her father said that. So that's how rare it was for him to yeah. say something like that. She didn't right. even remember it. Right. I would make a record. I made my own records in those days, and he would take it home. But, you know, he carried on that way in the studio and some of the tapes you hear. Make a long story short, those tapes I kept, all these tapes, and I kept them locked up. One day I was doing a cleanup. I said, well, let me give it to him. Had I known what was on those tapes, <laughs> listen, a president came down, Nixon. I, I now belong to the school of Nixon. <laughs> Get rid of the tape. <laughs> I love that. Th- this ben, does not Ben's sound like an abu- th- that's not an abusive man. No, I mean, the, he talks about it with like, oh, if I, you know, he's embarrassed by it or whatever. But certainly he's not defending. Oh, yeah. Well, I was an alcoholic. I was none of that stuff. It was like, uh, yeah, I don't know why I said I, I he, he, he could ne- he could needle you and needle you and that kind of thing. It's such a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, we hope you guys have enjoyed this first episode. We are going to go through, we're almost finished chapter one, guys. So to be fair, we got pretty close. But the first uh, s- installment of anything, including like, for example, the 15 Foundation, which we did, uh, the first episode is the one that's a little slowest going. Once we get going with more clips and get more clip heavy, you guys are going to s- sift through this thing like you wouldn't believe and re- re-listen to it, we hope. So thank you, Ben, for joining us on this one. And we'll yeah. try to get the uh, next recording session set up after we finish this this sam any closing thoughts on chapter one ish yeah we just had to get the exposition a little bit and you know it builds so it'll get more clip heavy as we go on so don't yeah. don't worry <laughs> don't despair <laughs> it's it's very important though to just point out what a bullshit liar he is so yeah, yeah. with the mandate yeah, of the and, whole show <laughs> and uh enabled uh, by the therapist that he pays. You know, just one last thing about this therapy. Therapy. Every now and then you get a little insight via impression of Ray Stern Howard, and, and, and Ben Stern. And Howard will on occasion do an impression of his mother in a weakened state saying, I tried my best. And she's worried that Howard is destroying her in therapy, which he therapy. is. He and his therapist have worked together to cast... These two loving, adoring parents who love everything about their son. I mean, I was what I I spaced it a little earlier. What I was trying to say was, when Ben found out that Howard was in the radio, he took him to see the the DJ in person who was doing a talk at the temple, and and introduced him to the guy afterwards to get some like advice. Mm-hmm. Um, they, anytime they recognized Howard showing an interest in something, they encouraged it. Beyond any parents I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, including, yeah, and, and I could certainly say my parents were not always, uh, you know, first on the in line to get me, you know, guitar lessons or whatever, because they knew I might change my mind the next day and not want them, and what a waste of money. But they, you're right, they enabled him, they allowed him every opportunity to do whatever he wanted, and I've never known parents like that, that support, yeah. never. And I, I, and I really, truly, you know, I started off listening in the 90s on the side of Howard Oh, you know, ben, Ray, Ray's the bad guy. Ben, ben is the uh, bad guy, whatever. And it only took me getting a little bit older and looking and actually revisiting these things and going, oh, my God, they were the good guys. Yeah. Um. You know, and especially history of Howard Stern. You know, you get confirmation from all of the kids who said they were our favorite parents to go to go see. You know, the the good relationship that he had. I mean, they talk about how Ben would joke with Howard and how um, the friends all felt welcome and that they would be such great storytellers and so on. And, yeah, Ben was the funny one. And it's truly tragic that in their old age, Ray still has enough wits about her to know that her son is destroying her in therapy. It's yep. really sad. I look like a conspiracy theorist now. I have like <laughs> all these, I'm crazy. I have all, my daughter's like, what? I what, She walked into my room. I have all these magazines and markers and my room open. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm preparing for my podcast. <laughs> Sam is, yeah. Sam is QF and on. Uh, anyway, I think that's about it for this one, guys. Thank you so much. Please enjoy. Uh, this and other episodes and also remember to check out our patreon subscribe on the black kluge 
uh, tier to get all weekly content, to make sure you get all weekly content on Patreon. we got a lot of great stuff coming up. And um, leave us comments where how you feel and uh, join our Facebook group. So take care, guys. Thank you. How you doing, man? I'm doing fine. I'm just doing great. If you weren't a boxer, what would you be doing? <laughs> to lie <lie-to> somebody. <laughs> do, you, do you think there should be random drug testing for athletes? Yeah, but most of look is more clean anyway. They just, they just go to a, a head thing. I mean, they go and do, they just make everything clean, so, yeah, they should. <laughs> Can't believe he went into boxing. <laughs>